and welcome to today's session on agent-based modeling, which is an introduction to a kind of computer simulation, which is extremely useful uh, in the social sciences and, and, and quite common called agent-based modeling. I call this first introductory session simulating social emergence because that's what we will be doing. We will be growing artificial societies and like from the bottom up, from the behavior of different agents, which often leads to very surprising and very confusing uh, outcomes. So we will completely out confuse ourselves uh, a little bit towards the end of the session and, <laughs> and then see what we can learn about this confusion about, uh, about societies and, and social behavior. And you will see that it's as confusing as, as social science can be and it need, will need a lot of creativity. So, all right, uh, stay, stay with me through this exploration of social emergence. So, if, if just to locate that within our computational scientific methods, um, we, we said we, we started out, for example, with empirical data, with big data. Uh, today, we will not work with empirical data. We will not really look at reality and what it looks like. We also won't do a lot of analysis uh, with some kind of, of data. Uh, we will do more theory. Now, you can do theory with pen and paper. Uh, Game theory, for example, is a formal way of, of doing pen and paper simulations. Uh, we will do simulations with computer and do theoretical worlds, worlds that not necessarily exist exactly like that in reality, but allows us to explore uh, the combinatorical array of possibilities, what in theory could exist, which is very important in social sciences because at the end, we want to make the world a better place, different, better than it ever existed. So we need theoretical exploration and computer simulation, agent-based modeling helps us in that pursuit. So that's what we were looking at today. And we will do so with the help of three questions. The first question I want to talk about is, what is a model? Well, a model is... Um, Wait, okay, let me, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, what is a theoretical model? But, but, you know, that's actually not a bad, that's actually not, not a bad idea to think about it this way. So just as these two here, uh, according to what Google told me, they are the highest paid models, human models, uh, around these days, uh, they are kind of like idealized versions, representations of a boy and a girl, of a man and a woman, right? So they model what are good looking, healthy, young men, women look like. So it's an idealized representation of it. Not that they always wake up exactly like this as well and that they always exactly look and behave like this, but when they're modeling, when they're modeling, they, they have this idealized representation. So, and that's what, I'm, what a Bayesian model is. We will talk more about that, about this abstraction, this idealized abstraction of reality. That's what models are. Second, we will play around with computer simulation. So how to grow increasingly complex artificial societies. We start with very simple models, very very abstract. Uh, they don't have, they have quite little to do actually with reality. And then we try to grow them more complex and more complex and really try to simulate uh, reality and things get as complex as in reality. And third, what can we learn from different agent based models, ABM? That's often the shortcut. Okay, so what is a model? I want to start with a quote from Lewis Carroll, a very important author. Lewis Carroll wrote Alice in Wonderland. And Alice in Wonderland, um, despite the Hollywood and Disney hype, is actually was actually originally in the 1800s, is, is a, actually is a book about mathematics. So, uh, you know, for example, it talks a lot about scale. Alice is too big or what is, uh, Alice is too small. What's the right scale so she can fit through the door? And there are a lot of mathematics. The question of time is also very important. A lot of mathematical references. So Lewis Carroll was actually a science, a science writer. Um, he is not a, trying to communicate it to the general public. So this is from another book, not from Alice of Wonderland, another book of his. And um, it starts like this, this conversation. What do you consider the largest map that would be really useful? 
I ask. Well, about about six inches to the mile. You know, so was, you represent a mile in reality with with six inches. So and that's that's the that's the representation that would be most useful. Only six inches! Exclaimed mein Herr. We very soon got to six yards to the mile. Then we tried a hundred yards to the mile, and then we came up with the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to a mile, because then you don't lose any detail. So I do represent just a mile with a mile, and you don't have to to compress it into into six inches. You use a lot of details there. Have you used it much? I inquired. It has never been spread out yet," said mein Herr. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut down the sunlight. So we now use the country itself as its own map, and I assure you, it does nearly as well. <laughs> of course, now the idea and the irony is that if you use the country yourself, you don't need a map. A map is a representation. It's an abstraction. It's an idealized representation of reality. And modeling is mapping. You you cannot keep all the details because the only really the only real working model of the universe is a universe. Now it's highly inconvenient to have a universe on your desk, so you have to abstract it. You have to lose some of the details, and that was modeling is about a very extremely creative process that is. And you can think about it this way also to, to see uh, the complexities. You have to uh, pick some sub aspects. That's how you abstract from reality. So here, for example, we have a social network, and you see the social network. But of course, it's part of a bigger network. It's everything is connected somehow, and that's actually part of a bigger network. Now you could take this bigger network as well and abstract it like this. Now both of these representation come from the same. Reality. They're different models, and it's not that one is right or one is wrong. The only thing that's really right is the original. It's a map, a mile to a mile.、Uh, the universe is the only real model of the universe. Everything else is an abstraction. You lose details. You cannot be as precise as the original, and that's the creative part, an extremely creative part that you have to think about. Well, how to best represent that in a meaningful and useful way, so we can actually think about it. We can put all this complexity of reality in this in this quite small information processing. Uh, equipment that we have here, and well, hopefully, expand it with computational information processing devices and tools, which can also help us to store some more information. Information, for example, data that we cannot only store here, and, and and help us to run through scenarios that we cannot run through as quickly. So we try to expand it, and that's the idea of computational social science. Now, while you do that,、uh, you also have to see what's a useful representation. And useful for us, in order to be able to process, is is not always exactly true to reality. For example, here you see the map of 1911 from the year 1911 of the underground subway system in London, the famous tube. Right, tube in London,、uh, and you see that's that's how the subway system looked in 1911, and that's how it looked in 1932, and that was the map, that was the official map. Now, if you try to read this map, it's kind of unwieldy, right? So you have the purple line that goes here, and then you see you see the green line, the green line that actually goes. Well, where does the green line go? It goes up, and it 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 goes down, and then and the red line. Okay, the red line goes up, and it go goes down. So,、um, well, right, it's 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 they really tried to to really draw it out as it is, but then in 1932, looking at this map, they said, well, we can do better. Actually, people get confused with that, and in 1933, they drew up this map. Now this map doesn't have the ambition to be as true as possible to reality. It helps to communicate the structure of the subway system to us, so we can better process it with our 
quite limited information processing capacities that we have. And now if you look at the purple line, at the red line and the green line, you see, yeah, well, okay, the green line goes, the green line actually goes from east to west. Well, that that is easy to understand. So if I want to go from east, I don't have to worry about all, every little up and downturn up. I just want to go from east to west. So I look at this map, that looks much better. Now, if maps even, if they come more, more detailed just because they grow in detail, so in the year 2002, that's what the map looked like. Good that we simplified it, right? Because you couldn't actually put every little wiggle turn of reality into that map. You could, you honestly, you could not read this map, right? So it does make sense to simplify it. And that's, again, additionally to see what you can leave out. It's a very creative act to see what you can leave out in order to best communicate the idea. It's almost like a narrative. Now, this narrative can also be done mathematically, for example. And that brings me to a very important point. Often when we think about how to do theory, we think like, okay, so we do theory just by basically, you know, we have this theoretical idea and we have this image of big scientists that they come up with big theories just because just because they're geniuses. So let's go with one of the biggest geniuses we were lucky enough to ever have in human history, Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. And as the famous story goes that I'm sure you heard before in school is that Isaac Newton was sitting under this tree and he was seeing how uh, an apple fell down to the ground and suddenly, whoa, he understood how the universe works, right? And he stood like, oh, it must be gravity. So the apple fell down, gravity, and, and he, he understood everything. We love these kind of stories <laughs> because, because they basically insinuate that, okay, you just like, you need to really relax. First of all, relax, go under a tree. And then if you're genius enough, maybe you are not, maybe I am not, but one of us will be genius enough. And that's really admirable that you're just so genius. You have this lucky, lucky insight, this, this stroke of insight, right? That hits you and then, Wow, you, under, you have the biggest theory and that's how actually Newton developed the theory of how the universe actually works, including gravity and, and all other things came to. This story is so convenient and it looks nice that actually what you see here, that's the first logo of Apple, of, of the computer company, Apple from, from your Mac and from your iPhone, right? So it's like really, it's easy. Just sit there, it's using an Apple is as easy as Newton's Apple, it's just, it's genius, just falls down and, you got everything done. Now, in reality, that, was, that wasn't really the case. Newton was a, a completely, a, a very grumpy, un unbearable uh, workaholic. He really, you couldn't even, you know, people really did, did try to take his distance. He was not this relaxed guy under, under the tree and so, no. He had it all scribbled out and then maybe when he saw the tree, there was something about this apple and, and, and certainly, I mean, if he wouldn't have done his homework, his hundreds and thousands of pages of equations and he saw this apple and, you know, he, he was able to creatively put the narrative together, but that would not have worked without putting all this formal and very tedious effort in that he did by developing his equations and his outlooks on how the universe actually works. So this myth is rather about, remember, the glass of red wine theory, right? We just love this idea that we just can sit there and just reflect with a glass of wine. We're like, yeah, I theorize, I think, and that's good and that's important. And we all do a lot of it because that's, we model all the time in our minds. We model social relations with your families, with your friends. We abstract, we leave out details, we cannot keep everything. And that's good that we do that. Now, if we do social science models or scientific models in general, we have to be a little bit more formal, right? Then these observations are extremely useful because they can feed our narrative and help us put things together. But we be a little bit more formal. And a little bit more formal means also that we interact with our tools, which brings us to our computational social science. I want to tell you another story here of Richard Feynman. So Richard Feynman is another physicist. Um, one of the biggest science, one of he's a he's the scientific hero of, of, of many scientists. So he, he lived in the last century. He was involved in, in, in creating the atomic bomb, which which 
a group of, of, of the best and the brightest of the days was involved. But he was actually also a very curious character. He loved to play the bongos. When he was kind of like bored in Los Alamos where they create the atomic bomb, uh, instead of going and actually ask for the secret codes in order to open the safes and get the documents out, he would just go there and just break the safes, the most secret safes that at the time that are all the secrets about plutonium production, the atomic bomb, and he would just go and break the safes and just, just to show that safes are not good, right? He had this famous, the Feynman Lecture of Physics, are still one of the leading lecturers in physics, actually. Anyway, so uh, a very important uh, polymath and, and, and great scientist. So once a journalist wanted to come to Feynman and actually try to figure out how this works, how Feynman gets to these, to these amazing theories that, of course, he got the Nobel Prize on the way, goes without saying, right? So uh, how, how does it actually work in your mind? The journalist wanted to know. You have these beautiful theories about the elegant universe, how it works, and then how limiting that you have to bring them down on paper. Like, what is this process like that you see kind of like the universe unfolding in front of your eyes in your mind, and then and then you have to put it into these sterile pen and paper equations in front of you? How is that? How is that? So the journalist wanted to know. And Feynman said, well, that's, that's not how it works. That's not how it is. It's not like I imagined you knew. And then, no, that's not, that's not at all how it works. Actually, I'm thinking together with the paper. So the paper is actually an extension of my thoughts. It's more like a kind of like an outsourcing. <laughs> you, know? you can think about it if you think about a computer structure. Now, it's more like a, a RAM, a random access memory, kind of like where you store some, some numbers and then you put them back. And without that, you couldn't think. The computer couldn't compute. You couldn't think without having a short-term memory or, or a long-term memory. Where you, and he says, now, it's not like I imagine the beautiful universe and then I, I put it. Like this, this, what you see here on this paper, these are my thoughts. Like these is really my thoughts without that. I couldn't think. I couldn't think through these complexities, these amazing complexities, without this interaction with these tools. The journalist would not want to buy this story because it's, again, it's not as beautiful as we would like it to have. We, love, we would love to think that there are these genius insights that you can just sit back on the bench, glass of red wine or whatever. But and Feynman, was, he got very upset at the end of the interview and, and basically kicked out the journalist because like, you, don't, you don't want to understand. That's not how thinking works on that kind of level. That's not how theorizing works on that kind of level. It's together with a tool that we do that. And when we're interacting with, with these tools, uh, it's important that we find the right language, the right language that works to represent uh, the phenomena we are interested in. Uh, so, for example, you could use the English language to describe something, uh, or you can also, for example, Deutsch name. Now, you might not understand what I said, but many philosophers love the German language in order to represent things, because in German you can make these extremely long words that describe a new concept extremely well. So, philosophers love using German. Or tal vez te gustaría usar el español, porque tal vez para algunos asuntos más románticas, más pasión. So, in Spanish, maybe there's more passion in it, and you want you want to use Spanish to describe something actually much better or your language of choice with which you can actually really represent what you're interested in. Now there are other languages as well uh, and to use the words of another big scientist, we have three very big scientists here, Galileo Galilei in the 15, now we go back to the 15, 1600, uh, Galileo said, nature philosophy is written in this grand book, I mean the universe, so back then you know, nature, philosophy, the universe was kind of like the same thing that was science was basically concentrating on in this, in this time. So reality, basically. It's written in this grand book, which stands continuously open to our gaze. But it cannot be understood unless one f first learns the, to comprehend the language in which it is written. It is written in the language of mathematics, he says, and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures without which it is impossibly to humanly understand a word. Without these, one is wandering in a dark labyrinth. So he basically says, if you use English language or any other language, natural language to describe that, you won't really understand what it's about because 
in his, what he was interested in is, is basically physics and the celestial bodies. He says, no, the language that they're behaving, that are best are there to describe them, are these triangles, are these shapes, are these circles. Newton then developed calculus. Calculus is the language of change. So if you really want to say how things change, natural language may not be the best. The language of calculus actually allows you to see how one thing changes and that changes another, how they actually change together. And if one thing changes, the other thing changes. Something can be moving, something can be accelerating. You know, it's, it's a very beautiful language that fits, fits these kind of problems, dynamical change problems. Now, in computational, in the computational era, we also use languages and we don't use triangles and shapes and we actually don't even use calculus. Don't, no worries. No need to learn calculus here. We use computer languages, Python, R, C++, whatever you want, or some codes which are, are very easy to learn. Today, we will look at some codes of a computer simulation software, which are more similar actually to natural languages. And we take this code. And with this code, we describe something. We describe the behavior of individuals, for example. So an individual actually walks and along the street, and then this individual, when it comes to the corner, 20% uh, chance makes a right turn, 80% chance makes a left turn. But we just, we just explain this phenomena in this kind of language. And once we have it coded up, we let it run. And then when we let it run, well, at the end, we get this computer simulation. Uh, that describes the reality. This here is SimCity EDU, actually. And then you can see, well, you have these individual agents here, for example, and when one comes to the street corner, you will see turns 20% uh, right and 80% and left, and you will see actually very complex emergent phenomena emerging from this, how you describe reality, and you describe it with computer language. Here you see some other simulations, and these are actually the models. These are the maps that we're doing. So these are maps just like the London Underground Subway map. So here you have a map of traffic in Chicago, and it's still an abstraction. It's pretty good. With computer simulations, we can get pretty close. Actually, we can even calibrate it with empirical data. Here with cell phone data, we calibrate where cars are actually moving. Chemical attack in Los Angeles, you see up here, and here you see a model a kind of like toy model of, of, of from the military um, and where to place soldiers. What 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 would be what would be happening if a revolt would play, uh, break out? What's the demand of security, for example? And these are models. These are abstractions of reality. But you can see, well, we can get we can get pretty close in modeling and mapping reality into that. We have a lot of the similar tools. The triangles and shapes of Galileo here are dynamical interactions among social agents that we have programmed in our computer language. And something that we will not have time to talk about today, but you will see, you are seeing actually more and more is that actually these computer simulation, these models are, are so good, they're merging with reality. So augmented reality, virtual models of reality, virtual reality, actually, as you can see here. And well, the, there are games like Pokemon Go and others where we merge them, uh, interactive maps. So we actually detailing reality by merging it with these virtual models of reality, which gives us additional information. And I want to leave you here with one example from a colleague of mine, Dawn Sumner, uh, from UC Davis, and how she's using the Keck Cave, which is a virtual simulation room here. Have a look at this video. So that's what I wanted to say about what is what is a theoretical model. So, okay, so we're done with our first question. Now we go to a more practical part, exploring, playing around, and it's just as much fun as playing playing SimCity. And the question is how to grow increasingly complex artificial societies. I want to start with a model which is very well known, which is Schelling's segregation model. Schelling is an, is an economist who then actually won the Nobel Prize uh, for this and, and, and other related work. And what Schelling was interested in, he was always interested in, in why societies especially cities, think about a city, uh, is so segregated. So you go into one neighborhood, uh, you have uh, a 
a neighborhood with with a certain ethnic origin, Chinatown or or a black neighborhood, and then you have a white neighborhood. Now, the interesting thing is when you talk to the people and you ask them, they would say like, oh, I would love to have a little bit more diversity in my neighborhood. I don't want to be only be surrounded by white guys. I would love to have a little cultural diversity, but but somehow, you know, it doesn't really, doesn't really turn out. So, so people seem extremely tolerant. I mean, they also say, like, okay, I don't want to be the only single person. You know, I like to be kind of like the oddball in, in the neighborhood. I want some people who are like me, but uh, I, I want a mix. I would love to have a mix. And Schelling was interested in that, how segregation actually happens in cities, a very ex- important question, especially today with all the polarization uh, that we're seeing in, this, in society. And um, that's a model that we're using a, a modeling software net logo in order to explore, explore what Schelling eventually won the Nobel Prize for. And that's what our simulation environment looks like. And I start with by populating this grid. That's actually my, my, my simulation landscape, we could say. And in this case, I randomly throw some 2,400 agents on that. So every little square is an agent. So now I threw 2,407 agents on there. Half of them are uh, green and half of them are red. These are my two different characteristics that might be different, two different races, for example, or two different political opinions, or or, or two different kind of sport club fans, or or whatever you would like. And I can randomly just throw them on here. So every time I throw them on here, I get a little different number. So now I have 2,413. And they're also uh, differently distributed. What I also uh, specify is that these agents, they want to have 50%, like half of their neighbor to be the same. And the neighbor is the one up and the one below and the, and the two to the sides. That's how you define neighbors. And if 50%, that's pretty toler- tolerant, right? So, I mean, uh, that means half of your neighbors could be, could be different, could be a completely different political, on the completely different extreme of the political spectra, for example. So that, that's a quite a tolerant society, actually. And I can define that here. And the ones who are with a cross are the ones that are unhappy. That means these are agents for which this criteria that I defined is not fulfilled. I see from the 2,405 agents I have here, um, about 40%, like almost 1,000 of them are unhappy. Again, every time I throw this on here, it's a little bit different. It's 42% now, um, 38%. It, it varies by, by these random conditions. Now I have exactly 40% uh, being unhappy. Now, how do agents make themselves happy. Well, they move around. Only the unhappy ones. So so about the thousand unhappy ones move randomly to a free spot. They do that in a random order. So one moved a, a spot gets free and then and then the other moves in a in a in a in a in a random order. And the ones that are happy, they stay put. They have no no reason to move. The criteria of having 50% of the sim of the neighbor similar is already fulfilled. All right. So let's go one and make them move. And we see that unhappiness actually decreases. It decreases a lot. So from 900, we are down to 500. And from 40%, we are down to to 23, 24%. So many of them made themselves happy just by randomly moving. They didn't look for anything, but they randomly moved um, without any specific goal. I mean, these these are blind agents. We didn't give them any capacity to see or to perceive or to search. They just randomly move and they find themselves like, okay, now now I'm in a happy situation, so now they stay put. Now the remaining 500 and something agents, they still move. Okay, let's make them move again. And we can see the unhappiness goes further down. More people find their adequate spot in society. So now we are down to 350 agents. And we can keep on going and have agents randomly move around in order uh, to see if everybody finds a level of happiness, if we find a stable equilibrium, a situation where nobody can get better off. And we still have four, two, one unhappy. Now we have zero unhappy. It took us about 20 steps, 19, 20 steps. Now everybody is happy, right? If no, nobody's moving, even if I keep on clicking here, no, no, nobody's moving. I, I don't have to go anymore. And um, what happened to society? Look, what, what was the result of this, uh, of this random movement? 
it gets much it got much more segregated, right? Actually, how these how the simulation work, if if you wondered, it works on a donut. So basically, this end wraps around to this end here, and this end wraps around to this end here. So it actually has a donut shape. So basically, what goes out here comes comes back here, and what goes out here that's this little piece here. So actually, it's a you know it's a continuous it's a continuous space. We just we just lay it out in these in these two dimensions. But we can see that the level of similarity here went up to, to 80, 86, 87%. So 87% of the neighbors are similar. We started out with a goal of having 50% of your neighbors similar. And we ended by having almost 90% of our neighbors similar. So it's quite tolerant people that actually end up in a very segregated society um, just by randomly uh, moving around. Let's do that again to make sure uh, this was not just coincident. Okay, so we press our setup. We get a different number of, uh, we can randomly set it up every time, vary it a little bit. Now we got 2,433 agent, 50% of the neighbors are similar. That's what we want. About 40% of them un are unhappy. And let's go again. Let's uh, have these 1,000 unhappy ones moving. Unhappiness goes down again to 500. And we saw similarity increase from 50% to 61%. Let's do that again. Again, now with similarity after three, st three steps, we're already in sim similarity of 74% here. That increased a lot. Unhappiness also went down a lot, um, down to 10% already. And we can... If we go all the way to equilibrium, trying to make everybody happy, some are still lost, some are still wandering around, uh, see if they can find something, some spot, and now we have three, uh, two, zero. Now everybody's happy again after about 20 time steps. And again, we got a very high level of similarity. It's a little bit different. Now it's 87.5. That depends on our random, that, that is dependent on our, on our random initial conditions, the initial conditions, which I randomly threw on there have a big effect, and also the random movement. I mean, the path that you take is, some that is, is every time a little different because that's how we basically flip coins uh, to see where the agent will, will move. Okay, let's do that again. Let's see. We can also do that a little bit faster. So now we just ran it through uh, fast, and we saw, again, a level of similarity of 80, 86%. Do that again. We run fast through the 20 time steps, 84%. We started... Again, we started with a similarity of about 50% here, and then we go quickly, again, 86%. So always a kind of like in the ballpark of about 86%. So um, 84% to 87%, that's a pretty high level of segregation coming up from, from 50%, which, which was our goal at the beginning. Let's explore some other settings. So if we change the similarity level that we aspire to, let's reduce it a little bit, right? Maybe 50% is very ambitious. Let's go down to maybe 26%. And uh, we can see again, if we randomly throw our agents on our simulation environment, 50% are similar. Um, at the beginning, at the outset, that's just by, by random chance because we, there, there are two, two different kind of agents, so half of them uh, will be similar at the beginning, but m much less are unhappy. Uh, only 11% of them are unhappy, like 300 are only unhappy. And if we do that, we see it's kind of like that ballpark, right? About 300 of them are unhappy, between 11 and 13% are unhappy. Okay, let's, let's do our game again. We start our simulation and we go uh, once. We see the, have, the, happy of lev of the level of unhappiness got slashed in half at the first step already. And if we keep on going, we see that we reach uh, equilibrium much quicker because we are not as ambitious in, in where we're trying to go. Uh, so we, we, we reach it quicker. And we also see the level of similarity is not as high. So we get to 70, 70%, up from 50% to 70%. That's, well, that's still extremely, extremely high. If you think of not as high as it was before, 15% uh, 15% lower than it was than it was before round, up, round about but we also decreased our ambitions from half of your neighbors have to be similar to to 26% of your neighbors have to be similar so if you do that again we see if that was just luck so we start again and we can see again about about 70% of, um, of similarity of segregation, 70% of segregation, that's what we end up with. Let's run it again, just to make sure. Again, well, 60, 68% of segregation we come up with, around 69.9%, around 70%. All right, so 
what happens if we decrease our similarity requirement from 26 to 25 percent? We have our setup, very similar, very similar conditions. Here, uh, 50 percent are similar. Um, and now if we go, we can see that our similarity increases from 50 percent. Actually, much quicker we reach an equilibrium from, from 50 percent. It only goes up to 55 percent. That means let's do that again to make to make just to make sure, fifty seven percent. Let's do that again just to make sure, again fifty five percent. So with one percent difference in our ambition, we decreased our level of segregation uh, by fifteen percent, right? So a small change there left led to a kind of tipping point. So these are these tipping points, these uh, emergent phenomena, these threshold uh, functions, these phase transitions, where just a small change leads to a, almost like a qualitatively different outcome. It's a different regime that it goes to, that I, that I tipped it over. That's what you want to look for if you're a policymaker. You want to look for just a little push to the system and a big policy effect. So we saw this tipping point on this side here. Let's go, let's go to the other end. If you go to the other end and we start at, at 70, no, now, now we are very ambitious. Now we want 75% of our neighbors to be the same. So we have our setup again. We start with 50%, but we can already see like, whoa, there are many grumpy people. Like not many people are happy here because it's very ambitious, right? 88% of our people are unhappy. So let's move them around. Let's see if they can find a little bit of happiness. And, well, they have to really search in order to find something. Unhappiness is kind of like going down, but it takes a while. We had 50% unhappiness, 55% unhappiness. Let's, let's uh, increase that a little bit. Unhappiness down to 20%, 15%, about 10%. And uh, we do find equilibrium there as well. It took us quite a while, but, wow, do we have a level of segregation. 99.9%. .9 and you can see between them, there are like these buffer zones, right? And nobody lives. They're kind of like nicely separated. All the red over here. Oh, yeah, it continues over here. And the green are basically here. So, yes, very separate society that we got uh, with 75%. Let's do that again just to make sure. Uh, set up again. And we keep on going. Let's just have it run automatically. We see the level of unhappiness is going down. We had 50%, 40%, 30%, 20%. 20 but it needs some time for, for them to find kind of like a... Uh, a lucky spot. We, and we see these two clusters here actually emerging, the red cluster uh, and the green cluster. And again, 99.9%. .9 very, very segregated society. So, I mean, this is, this is extreme. If you look at the society, I mean, that's, that's social segregation, right? I mean, if, if these would be racist, that would be extremely racist. Even so, I mean, they're, they're still quite tolerant. You know, they only want, well, they want the majority, 75% of the neighbors to be similar, but they still tolerate uh, different people. But extreme, the outcome is absolute social segregation. Let's see if we increase that from 75% to 76%. And we again start with a random setup and uh, we press go. And uh, what do we find now? Well, actually, there's, there's no segregation happening, right? I mean, many people are unhappy, uh, but actually we find a perfectly mixed society. The level of similarity keeps on staying here at, at 50%. So actually what we did is we increased our level of, you could say, racism uh, on, on the level of the individual, and the emergent social phenomena, the total is more than the sum of its part, right? The, the emergent social phenomena is, is qualitatively different. Something, a, a phase transition happened here as well, but just making a little change. Now we have a perfectly mixed society, quite unhappy and always moving. You know, in reality, these moves would not be so quickly. Like you would move your house maybe every five years and so forth, you would be unhappy. So, but, but it would be a perfectly mixed society. So actually quite interesting, right? We make, we make people more, more racist and we get a more tolerant society. Counterintuitive, but with these simulations, uh, we can get to the bottom of phenomena like that. So there are several things we have noticed in, in playing with, with the simulation of shell and segregation model. First of all is the total is different 
than some of its parts. Uh, people are very tolerant, actually. They don't want to live in a segregated neighborhood. They are quite tolerant, 50%, but then they end up in segregated neighborhoods. That's a typical game. Now you saw social emergence at work. We grew it ourselves, basically. Some also some things were very surprising. For example, that that the total racists at the end they, that led to actually a very mixed society. So very uh, non-intuitive. But you go to the bottom of it, it, it does make sense. So that's why you need this formal language because this thinking tool can be extremely deceptive. Our intuition is sometimes useful, but can also lead you astray. So formal models make you better thinkers because they allow you step by step to think through something with all your assumptions formally recorded, kind of like Richard Feynman had it on the paper going back and forth and we are thinking together with the model. It makes us better models and we can even understand non-intuitive conclusions that just by thinking about in the blue, we would have never gotten to. We also saw there is a, there's an important dependence on the initial conditions. So how I throw my agents uh, on my environment, that, that has an important outcome. Every time it's a little bit different, the result, but there's also a kind of like invariant distribution. Sometimes you get this kind of segregation, that kind. It's, it's kind of like similar, 85, 86%, but it's in a ballpark. And you do this many times, you would run the simulation 1,000, 10,000 of times, and we get a distribution among these 85 and 86%, and then we can say, well, with 20% likelihood, that will be the level of segregation, and with 80% likelihood, that will be the level of segregation. So you have a distribution of these equilibrium outcome. In this case, the simulation always went to an equilibrium. It stopped at the end, except the last one, right? And we see these phase transitions. So uh, just a little, you can tip something, these tipping points, these phase transitions where you push a, a model a lot, a lot, nothing happens, and then suddenly you push it and something big happens. That's what every policymaker likes, uh, loves to identify, just put a little bit more money in and then you have this huge, so, and you often see these tipping points in society, these non-linearities. Now, the tipping points we saw here, and you probably already had a suspicion, be aware of your modeling assumptions. So the fact that it kind of like flipped at 25% at 75% has also something to do with how we program the agents, right? That you take an average among your four neighbors. So having more complex more complex models actually, and now we will go to a more complex models of shelling, will then also allow you to identify these phase transitions with more fidelity. Now it doesn't change the fact that we very often encounter these phase transitions because also in society, we often have these, you know, dipping these, like at the end, you have to take an average at some point and then you flip over. So that's where often these tipping points also come from, from the interactions among people and summing up these interactions leads to these unexpected qualitative transitions. Now, just to take a little break here and reflect, you can use the conclusions that we had that we just derived now here to make larger social science theories now out of it. As we said, a theory is actually a family of models. So we had one model here, one implementation of Schelling's model, and we could, for example, now start to explore theoretically, and that's kind of like, let's do some glass of red wine, right? We try to explore a little bit further. Uh, so there's a lot of tolerance, and we saw kind of like a cycle that actually quite tolerant people, 50% tolerance or even 25% tolerance, led to a lot of separation. And if we have very segregated neighborhoods, that also over time can lead to a lot of polarization because you're only surrounded by like-minded, you're kind of like in this echo chamber and you become more extreme by only kicking around ideas among the like-minded, right? So society actually polarizes over time. It becomes more extreme. We have more extremism, which then as the extremism becomes too big, could backslash because at the end we saw Actually, if you go over the tipping point of 75%, we had pretty intolerant individuals. So the individuals, each individual has been, has been quite extremist. And that actually then at the end led to a more mixed society. By being so extremist, they were forced to mix up because they could never be satisfied with the extremism. And you could theorize now that there are these, these long-term cycles 
maybe in human history. So now you would go back to your data, look at empirical data and see, can we see that? So over the history of the United States over the last 250 years, I mean, we have data. Can we see a cycle like this where societies sometimes are more tolerant? Think about the 1960s as 1970s, and then they start to separate 1980s, 1990, and then they get to maybe more extremism, more polarization. Many people say right now we live in an age of extreme polarization, and maybe after that, well, I don't know if that theory actually explains that, but what we're doing now here is looking for families of models that can give us larger social science theories. Now remember that these theories are based on models which are based on assumptions. And we said that every model is an abstraction of reality, an idealized abstraction of reality. And the fact that some of the phenomena we observed were kind of like, oh, 25%, 75%, that's very suspicious. We should, we should check that if, if that had to do with our modeling assumption of our four neighbors or if there's actually more to it. So we can grow increasingly more real uh, artificial societies by putting in additional modeling assumptions and increase the fidelity, actually, being all, almost moving closer to reality until we have a one-to-one -one map. Now, we, don't, we, we cannot get there, or it's useless to get there, actually, but we want to get a little bit closer. So here is another uh, implementation of Schelling's model by Gessler, which you can also look up. And we have more types, for example. We have more sophisticated neighborhoods. So instead of only looking at the four, we can look at more sophisticated. You could even look at social networks for example, and take averages among social networks, right? It doesn't have to be like your four neighbors uh, and more sophisticated mobility patterns. So have a look at this simulation. So that's what our modeling environment uh, looks like here. Here I can adjust the proportion of agents. So I have my blue and my red agents, my Republicans and Democrats, if you want, depends on whatever you want to model. And let's take a different um, decision rule, a different a circle of influence. So let's don't base our decision of, of happiness only on our immediate, on our immediate neighbors. Uh, but let's look a little bit further out because that's in, in reality, uh, you know, that's actually also reasonable because, you know, you might not, you, your immediate neighbor might not be exactly like you, but as long as in your entire neighborhood on average, you pretty much feel at home and uh, and, and you feel like they're kind of like your people, uh, you're, still, you're still happy, right? Or if you live in dorms, maybe your immediate neighbor is a fan of a different sports, sports team, but maybe on your entire floor, I mean, you're mainly of this kind, and then you, you feel very much, very much at home there, right? Because the, the majority of people actually in your surrounding um, are similar to you. So let's look, instead of uh, just the cell next to you, to a 16-cell ring environment and see see what's the effect that we have here. So let's fill out a grid. We have our red and our blue. And let's run and see what we are getting. We still see a changing. They're still adjusting here. 200, 100, uh, 50 people are still adjusting. And we reach our equilibrium. Now nothing changes anymore. And there uh, were well, some interesting patterns. We can certainly see some segregation, some clusters here and there. But on average, it's well, it's also kind of like mixed, right? What would happen if we increase uh, the circle that we consider? So from a 16-cell environment to 24-cell neighborhood. So, so instead of in your dorms only considering your floor, you might consider the entire building. Or, or instead of only considering your neighborhood, you consider the entire suburb. And, and you see if you feel at home at the entire suburb. What do you think... Uh, will happen. Will you get more or less segregation? And think about it a little bit and why would that be? All right, let's check it out. So let's fill our grid. Here we go. And run. And we see actually it looks a little bit more mixed, but uh, oh wait, or maybe not. Um, well, actually it seems, yeah, that seems, that seems clearly more segregated, right? Now we actually do have, do have different islands of pink and, and different islands of, of blue ones, and, and the black ones are the empty spaces, so people still moving around in the empty spaces trying to make themselves happy. But uh, yes, they are mainly 
there clearly now there's there's more segregation now, and, and that makes also sense because if you if you can also reach further, right? You try to get to a spot with a further circle of influence. You try to get to a spot where there are more people like you, where the end makes you end up where there are more people like you, right? Because you can actually you can actually see further. All right, let's play a little bit around more with some other versions. We can only, in this simulation, not only go to two, so we cannot only have Republicans and Democrats. We can also have, um, I don't know, the Green Party, the Ecological Party, and the, the ultra-conservatives, for example. So we have now four colors, and let's also play around with a different rule. So instead of just going there and seeing if you're happy or not, let's go to assimilation. So what that basically means is uh, if the majority of people around you, and in this case I chose an eight-cell neighborhood, so the eight cells around you, if the majority uh, is there of a, of a certain kind, then they kind of like, they convince you. You will also become like them. So you become more and more like them, uh, depending on, on your, you assimilate to them. So instead of having Republicans and Democrats, we could have, I don't know, bears and Bruins and Tridons and, and Aggies. Here, right, and, and if you're around uh, a lot of Aggies or around a lot of bears or Bruins, it might like you, you know, you, you might start to to get used to watching their kind of team, and, and you you catch yourself cheering for them then over. So you kind of like assimilate with the major with the majority. So let's see what happens here if we go to an eight cell neighborhood and um, we run that, and we see that. Well, here there are still some, some patches of Aggie. Some Aggies still, still survive here, down here. They're still trying to find their happiness. Um, also, the, the tridents are still there. But the majority, there's a very strong segregation between, between bears and Bruins because they're also the majority of people that we put in here. So what if we go now increase again uh, the circle of influence? So from an eight-cell neighborhood, let's go, to a, let's go big. Let's go to a 48 cell neighborhood. Uh, what do you think? Will we get a more equally distributed landscape or a less equally distributed landscape among these four parties in, in this kind of game setup, in the assimilation setup? And, and, and why would that be? All right, let's check it out. So let's, let's fill our landscape again. And here we run. Oh, wow, wow, that's, well, that's bad news for the Aggies, I guess, and, and for the Tridents, I guess, because there's not really, not a lot left. Oh, wait, here as well, they're still, oh, they're retreating here as well. They're kind of like, oh, now they found a, sta they stabilized. Oh, good, they, they are strong enough here to stabilize, and, and we found that. So, basically, if your circle of influence increases, and that's, that actually increased, then the assimilation, uh, goes, we found out that in this case, the assimilation uh, concentrates on the majority, right? So the majority has, has more possibilities to convince these, these little fringe opinions, for example. So if you think about it in a social science setting, you know, 150 years ago, oh, 1860, when, when Lincoln was elected president, People in California didn't know who was president for about for, for a week and, and longer because information had to travel on the back of a horse. Yeah, somebody had to ride from the East Coast to the West Coast and, 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 and tell the news to the people over here in California that actually who is president, right? So the circle of influence was a very localized and with mass communication, with, with, with mass media and also, of course, now with telecommunication, with the Internet, the circle of influence basically got global. So that might also, now you have here the beginning of a theory of, of, global, of global opinion concentration, right? So the, the little fringe opinion, the minority opinions, and we can run this again to see it a little bit clearer. The minority opinions, if we go uh, here again to the, the eight cell neighborhood, they can survive much better when, uh, when the circle of influence does, does not go so far out when, when it stays in a, in, in a local setting because they can support each other, they can still find each other, they can maintain their little local um, uh, niche, same as here even the gray ones can. Um, 
In contrary, if again, if you if you make a bigger circle of influence, what we will find is that quickly the majority opinion kind of like takes over, and you can even see among them until whoa, here even they had to had to go, and these ones here have to go because the majority is just too strong because the circle of influence goes so far out that eventually they come from all sides, and we do find a, a stable equilibrium here but it's, it's extremely segregated among only two, on, about, among only the two majorities. Now, the, the circle of this, the influence of an opinion, for example, doesn't only come to the person who, who gets influence, but uh, we could also imagine that the person who gets influence can move to a certain degree. So for now, what I'm setting that I chose here is that the person who moves to try to get to find more happiness in order to find more like-minded people can move up to three steps. What do you think will happen if we restrict that and the person that moves can only move one step further? Will you get a more equal or a less equal distribution among the diversity of, of for example, of opinions? Let's check it out. So let's fill it up again and let's run it. Quite an important amount of yellow ones and even gray ones uh, is surviving. Right? We have here even some gray ones and they're pretty much mixed here. So you don't have this clear dominance that you had before because people cannot move as far so that leaves to some kind of diversity. I mean, these, these blue are just trapped here in, in red land because they, they cannot go anywhere else. So a few hundred years ago, when we didn't have automated transportation, you were just stuck in a village and you had to talk to these people in the saloon next to you because, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't go anywhere else. So, so you were forced to live and, and to deal with diversity because you couldn't go, couldn't go any further. What if we would increase now the mobility to 200 steps? So now you can, you can travel very far to the other side. What do you think we get? We get a more or a less diverse uh, society. Check it out again. And um, yes, you get uh, a less diverse society. People can travel pretty far, and that's also, uh, think about with, with transportation, we can now go wherever we want. In the internet, especially, the like-minded is only a click away. So in contrast to, to the, the village that we were living in a, a few hundred years ago, and we had to go to the local saloon or restaurant or bar and, and deal with these kind of people that happen to be there, now, with one click, we can be with the like-minded. And, and that's also, also what happens, and it leads to a lot of polarization. So this is the beginning of the simulation of a model to try to understand the generating mechanisms that are behind some of these mechanisms that, for example, lead to, to polarization in society and, or to segregation. Uh, in this case, I, I, I had a model of assimilation, of, of opinion assimilation, for example. And you can even make it more real. So you could adjust it to geography and now combine it with, for example, with your digital big data footprint about real maps and map it to neighborhoods, how they actually evolve. So here uh, you have other models of this extension. And Schelling, he is. Uh, the Nobel with his Nobel Prize, right? When, uh, and he wrote this very interesting book that I highly recommend to you. It's called Micro Motives and Macro Behavior where you can see very nicely how these micromotives I am motivated to look for 50% of kins and 50% and of diversity, how they can lead to macro behavior, social behavior, right? As social scientists, we take the bird's eye view, we take society as this, as this living being and see how it behaves. So that's macro behavior, which comes out of micro motives. And, and that's what we're trying to explain. So we are not in psychology, we don't necessarily want to look inside and see, like, why is this? We have these micro motives forgiven and then social dynamics on a higher level of subtra abstraction that include uh, all society. So coming back to my previous point, Schelling's data has been tested. Schelling's theory has been tested with empirical data. So empirical data from Los Angeles, Milwaukee, Cincinnati, 
Omaha and Kansas City show that the shelling description of preferences is broadly correct, but that the empirical curves are less regular than those posited by Schelling. So, of course, Schelling, who did that theoretically, actually didn't even have computers to do that, uh, presented very ide idealized curves, the curves that we saw in reality is a little bit more messy because there are much more complex things uh, that are happening. Some details we leave out, which makes the curves a little bit more wiggly. So, and that's, that's normal. I mean, we're trying to abstract and trying to understand just as if we would have had the map of the London tube of the London Underground, like if you really have every wiggle in there, uh, so that you don't get the idea. So here, with an idealized model, you get the idea. And of course, reality is a little bit more wiggly, let's put it like this. So summing up is that the new science of artificial societies suggests that real ones are both more predictable and more surprising than we thought. Computers will probably never enable us to foresee the future in detail, but we might learn to anticipate the kind of events that lie ahead and uh, where to look for interventions that might work. So that's the idea, basically. The idea is not to build a one-to-one -one map, but to have a theoretical understanding and to look for interventions that might work. Let's have a look at another model from our simulation software called NetLogo. NetLogo is a software uh, that's freely accessible, uh, developed by Yuri Velensky in Northwestern University, and you can download and look at it here. And I want to walk you through another very seminal model, which is called Sugarscape. And Sugarscape is described in this very important book, a pioneering book that got many people hooked on the idea of agent-based modeling by Joshua Epstein and Robert Axtell called Growing Artificial Societies. So, all right, let's check out Sugarscape. So we start by opening up the models library, which is here under files. And in the models library, there are uh, a bunch of, uh, of models to explore under social science we find another folder here called sugarscapes okay so let's go to this one so it's um, it's part of of net logo and uh, well you see the interface here and uh, we can do setup but we don't really know what's going on so what you do is you go to the second tab here so there are three windows there are three tabs uh, interface that's what we see here that's where we explore the simulation information and code. Um, well, in code, you can actually change the code. And it's, 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 a, pretty, it's a pretty readable code. code. There, are, there are explanations here. And here say set color to red, set shape to circle. OK, so it's, it's really, it's just like English language, actually, the code. Very similar to that. So, but uh, we first want to know what's going on. So you go to this info tab, to the second tab, and we can read what's going on. What is it? Uh, this first model in its logo sugarscape suite implements Epstein and Axel's sugarscape immediate grow, uh, grow back model as, as described in chapter 2 of their book, Growing Artificial Societies, Science from the Bottom Up. It simulates a population with limited spatially distributed resources available. Oh, that's, that's a reasonable assumption. So there are limited spatially distributed resources available. For example, if you look for, for resources in an agricultural society or you look for minerals, for oil, and, and you see how that actually then uh, influences the, uh, the, the society that, uh, that emerges from that, how it works. Each patch contains some sugar, the maximum amount of which is predetermined. At each tick, okay, so we have patches and we have ticks. So the patches are basically the blocks of the environment, and the ticks is the time uh, that, that, that keeps on going. So a tick is a period in time, and a patch is a, is, is a period, is, is a, a space, a location in space. So each of them has sugar, and uh, what did it say? Um, at each tick, each patch grows back to, uh, fully to have the maximum amount of sugar, which is predetermined. The amount of sugar a patch currently contains is indicated by its color. The darker the yellow, the more sugar. Okay, so we have actually darker yellow up here and lower yellow down here. So we basically have two hills of sugar. You can think of these as two hills, right? With, with more sugar, two sugar hills here, two sugar scapes. At setup, agents are placed at random within the world. Each agent can only see a certain distance, horizontally and vertically. 
each at each tick, each agent will move to the nearest unoccupied location within the vision range with the most sugar. So, okay, so each agent can see horizontally and vertically and then moves to the next location which has the most sugar and collects all the sugar that's there. If this current location has as much or more sugar than any unoccupied location it can see, it will stay put. That makes sense. So they're basically uh, sugar maximizing agents and wherever they can see they go if there's more sugar and if not they just keep on staying there. Agents will also use and those lose a certain amount of sugar each tick, each period of time based on their metabolism rate. If an agent runs out of sugar, it dies. That's also reasonable. How to use it? Set the initial population slider before pressing setup. This determines the number of agents in the world. The initial population slider, okay. So initial population, we have 400 agents here. Um, before we press setup and then we press setup, we could probably change that to 1,000 agents. Woo, might be a little, little much. So let's, let's keep it at 400. That's what they recommended setup um, and start with, start with that. Press setup to populate the world with agents and import the sugar map data. Uh, Go will run the simulation continuously, while Go once will run one tick. Okay, so let's see what happens. We go once, oh, we see the agents moving. And we go once again, and we see the agents moving again. And they seem to be moving towards the sugar, which, which, which makes sense. Some of them already stay put because, well, they're happy with the sugar that they have, and they cannot see any any more sugar. And we see, well, we see some things. We see the population. We start out with 400. It's actually decreasing. Well, some of them die on the way. And if we keep on going, we can also accelerate that. And we keep on going now fast. We go 100, 120, 140 ticks. So we can automate that. We see, well, the population now stabilized at about 250 and uh, what you see here is uh, how the wealth is distributed within these 250, right? So well, the wealth is basically, basically sugar, the amount of sugar that each one has. And we see there's quite an amount of agents with little sugar and, and, and very few agents with a lot of sugar. So here on the horizontal, on the horizontal x-axis, you can see the amount of sugar and upwards vertically is, is the amount of agents, the number of agents. And you can see kind of like four income groups. Right? Why, why do you think these four income groups emerge in our model? Well, okay, like these are these four terraces, right? So nobody moves here anymore. So these, they're kind of like stuck at the edge here. That means they go to the most sugar. They, don't, they, they cannot see further. They, don't actually, they won't move further because that's how far they get. And then they're happy here. And we have these four terraces. One, two, three, four. And that's, that's where they find... That's where they find their stable space. All right, let's explore it a little bit more. In the information, it says what else to do. The visualization chooser gives different visualization options and may be changed while the go button is pressed. Okay, so the visualization chooser, the visualization chooser is here. All right, so we can start again and we can visualize the agents by vision. So they have different visions. And what does it mean? It means... Um, uh, the agents with the longest vision will be darkest. Similarly, color agents by metabolism, uh, the ones with the lowest metabolism will be darkest. That means the ones that can see furthest and the ones that need less sugar, who are highly efficient agent, uh, highly productive sugar converting machines, uh, they are darker. So by vision, you can see some of them are darker and some of them are lighter. And uh, by metabolism, and the same thing if you do the setup. And that's, that's one of the benefits of agent-based modeling, that each agent can have different characteristics. We don't need to give them, you know, all of them one average characteristics. We can have this diversity, which leads to interesting emergent phenomena, just like the diversity we have, we have uh, similar in, re in, in real societies. Okay, so let's run it again. We go once and we see... Uh, our population decreasing. We see also that actually the ones who disappear are more the lighter ones, so the ones that don't have a great vision because, well, now a lot of them disappeared because, well, they kind of like get stuck. They cannot see further with a little 
you know, they're pretty blind, and unfortunately, that's how far they get. We again have our wealth distribution emerging. We can do the same for metabolism through our setup, and we see as well the lighter ones are the ones that have to go first. Our population is decreasing here, and interesting, our average vision is actually increasing. So at the beginning, we have an average vision of 3.5, and that is increasing. Try to watch that. The same, the metabolism, we have a metabolism of 2.6 or 7 at the beginning. It's decreasing. Um, right now at 2.2 after 13 periods of times. If we keep on going, yes, we see the vision increasing slightly, slightly and the metabolism decreasing. What's happening here? It's evolution. <laughs> we, we evolve our society. It's the survival of the fittest. The ones with the best vision and with the lowest metabolism survive. And on average, as the inefficient agents kind of like get moved out of the market, uh, what we have is on average a higher vision. So we started with 3.5 and end with 3.8, 3.9 of vision. And uh, we started with a metabolism of 2.7 and we, we ended with 2. So, yes, on average, our society gets fitter. We evolve our society. Let's take a little inventory of all the little building blocks we had here in, in the computer simulation that we just played with. First of all, we had agents. They're very important. That's why it's called agent-based modeling. We model agents from the building societies from the bottom up. That's actually the subtitle of this book. So it says, Growing Artificial Societies, Social Sciences from the Bottom Up. So with agent-based models, we start modeling these agents. In our case, they're individuals. Could be something else. Uh, but in our case, they're individuals. And uh, their, their existence, if they are alive or if they're dead, depends on the available resources. So they are or not, depending on the available resources, which already starts giving them traits. So they have traits. They have some fixed traits, the traits that do not change. So they are fixed. For example, their resource storage capacity, the amount of sugar they can store, that's given. It's not equal for everybody, but it's, but it's given. Might not be equal for everybody. The research uses capacity, the metabolism. There are some that have a very strong metabolism, and that certainly is not equal for everybody, and, and some that have a very slow, a weaker metabolism. And that is distributed, such as, you know, these kind of things are distributed in society. And we see with this diversity, we see some interesting behavior. There's not like one average. And modeling diversity is very important. Other, the research detection capacity, basically the vision. So they can see three straight units ahead. And that's also distributed differently among among society. The vision, uh, how, many, how many straight units they can see or cannot see. Uh, and these are fixed. These are not equal for everybody, so there's a distribution of these, but they don't change. There are also variable traits, traits that change over time. For example, the amounts of resources stored. So it's kind of like the ticker and you use the amount of resources up, so we also have to make sure we keep track of that. We have to program that in our agent to program how much resources there are, and that's changing. That's a variable trait that changes at each tick of time it changes. There are also rules, so there are traits and there are rules. Rules, there are also fixed rules. Move to the closest unoccupied patch with the most sugar. That's a rule that does, does not change. Um, there are no variable rules in this game. Could be, but we have only this fixed rules, for example. And then we have the environment. So we have agents and we have the environment. And, and we have this interaction between the two of them, right? The environment also is a, has traits and has rules. So the environment in our case is a sugar lattice. It's, uh, it, it's on a torus, basically on a donut, right? So that's the design that we have. You could have other designs, but ours is, is on a torus, on a donut. That's what it looks like. And there are traits, there are some fixed traits, for example, the research storage capacity. That does not change. So each patch, each pixel in the background, in the environment, has a capacity that does not change, which then leads to these mountains, right? We have two mountains of sugars. And they're variable traits, so that's the amount of resources stored. So again, we have to program in that we track how much resources actually are in there. And if, if you consume all, if an agent consumes all the resources, they are gone, so we have to track that. And there are rules, for example, Grow back sugar, grow back sugar immediately. And that's one rule that we had. Now, we can change these rules. 
uh, and some of the characteristics and some of the traits, try to make it more realistic and that leads to different models, maybe more sophisticated models with different outcomes. So let's change this last rule, the sugar growback rule, which leads us to sugar scape number two. So let's go to the models library and go to the next one, sugar scape number two, which is called constant growback. And in constant growback, uh, let's see in info, it's also based on uh, implements Epstein and Axel's sugar scape model is described in chapter two of the book. Uh, it differs from Sugarscape 1 immediate growback model in that the growback of sugar is gradual rather than instantaneous. Well, just a, a slight change uh, in, in modeling assumptions. And it also makes sense. Resources don't grow back immediately. They take some time to grow back. And let's see what this little change in making assumptions are a little bit more realistic. What, what the effect of this little change is on our model outcome. So everything else the same. We start set up and we go, agents move. We can also go a little bit faster. And we see, well, the four terraces are actually not building. The model keeps on going and going. We're already now in 270 uh, time steps and we see the population actually went down quite a bit and they keep on moving and moving. So they do not find a stable point where they sit put. And also, um, yeah, there are some, there are some income groups here, but something in between them as well. Why do you think agents don't stay still and, and, and keep on moving in this model? Well, yeah, it's because the ones who see more uh, will, once they ate all the resources which are at this spot, will move on to the next spot, right? So if we also see, for example, the vision of them, we see, well, there are some with a very high vision. And basically, yes, they keep, they keep on moving. So once they ate it, they move on to the next one, eat it, and they don't stay put there where, where there's nothing there because it takes some time on this patch for it to grow back. That's why they constantly by the agent constantly keep on moving. Um, and then we have kind of like three income groups that are emerging here. And another interesting thing, I think the population actually, I think I remember in the other one, we, we, we stabilized a population of 250. Here we have a population of 220. So actually it's more, more some agent, less agents made it at the end. Maybe that also had an effect on the vision and the average metabolism. Let's see. Okay, so in this, in the constant, in the sugar scape, number two, the population is down to, let's say, 220, starting with 400 at the beginning, and the vision increased uh, to about four, and the average metabolism decreased to about 1.7, 1.8. Okay, let's remember that, 220, 4, 1.7, 1.8. Let's compare that with our previous simpler model, the sugar scape number one. And um, see here, what do you think? Do we have less or more evolutionary pressure in the second model than in the first? Let's check it out. So we start with 400. Uh, the population is decreasing. Now it actually stabilized. We can also take the inventory. Nothing is changing much anymore. We have a flat line here. Yes, 250. So then from 400 to 250, where's the second model where, where sugar needs some time to grow back, went down to 220. And also the vision went up to, to 3.8 only. And the metabolism went down to 1.9 only. Yes, yeah, so... Actually, there's a stronger evolutionary pressure in the second, in sugar scape second. Uh, you, have to be, you have to be fitter in order to, to make it. Some more die, and at the end, the fitter survive, which then brings up the average vision. And it's still increasing, it's still increasing. Even so, 200, 300 periods in, it's still increasing. There's still some evolution, evolution happen. The metabolism still goes down. A little bit. So there's more evolutionary pressure when the environment is also changing because a changing environment needs intelligent and adaptable and adjustable agents in order to be able to deal with it. And that accelerates evolution. 
All right, let's see what else they have here in the models library. Sugarscape number three called Wealth Distribution. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I think most of it is basically the same. If we go to the description, uh, something here changed uh, down here. And it says uh, each agent also has a maximum age. Also quite a realistic assumption, actually. Uh, which is assigned randomly from the range between 60 to 100 ticks. So I might, might say 60 to 100 years. And yes, that's what you do. Randomly, you use the random variable. If you don't really know if some of them, who of them actually lives longer and who not, and at the end, yes, you just say randomly. That makes sense. People live between, well, 60 and 100, but more about this age range. And then you distribute that. You have a, a certain diversity that reassembles reality better. When the agent, agent reaches an age beyond its maximum age, it dies. Okay. Whenever an agent dies, either from starvation, so we still have that, or old age, a new randomly initialized agent is created somewhere in the world. Hence, in this model, the global population count stays constant. All right, so we have a global population count because they always get... Uh, Replaced. We also see the population slider here is actually not here anymore. There are some other ones. Wealth distribution. We start with 400 agents as well and start with our setup and then we go. What we also have here, we have two other sliders that measure something and they measure the income distribution, the income inequality. That's called a Lorentz curve. So here's the uh, percentage of population. Here's the percentage of wealth. It's not so important that you that you understand it. It's it's. But think about if if income would be uniformly, completely equally distributed, this red curve here, this Lorentz curve, would be on this black line. The further the curve kind of like goes away and 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 bellies bellies out has a belly here. Uh, the more inequality we have, if it would be completely a rectangle here, then it would be extremely unequal. So the bigger this area, basically this area between the diagonal and the and the red curve, the more unequal the income distribution. And this area on the curve is measured with what's called a Gini coefficient, which you can see evolving down here, and it gets bigger, it gets higher. This blue. Um, as the as the curve kind of like bellies out, and so basically that's the it's a, as a measure for inequality. The higher it is, the more uh, unequal, and the lower it is, the more equal. All right, so we can now see how it evolves. Inequality goes up a little bit. We can also see that because the wealth distribution becomes more unequal. Again, here we have the number of agents, and here we have the amount of sugar, the wealth, and we can see eventually that we have. Most most of our agents have very little sugar. So they're here on the left side of the amount of sugar. And very few agents here have a lot of sugar. So they have almost like 200 sugar, whereas those here, almost 200 agents, have very little sugar. We see it kind of like stabilizes now the inequality. And we get a wealth distribution that is highly unequal. Actually, this wealth distribution, we know it quite well. It's called a Pareto distribution. And that's how uh, inequality is and, and historically always has been distributed in society. It's a power law. It's, it's a, dis a certain distribution, just as the other distributions, the normal distribution, the exponential distribution. This is a, a power law. It's a, it's a distribution. And what it says is that there are exponentially few agents with exponentially much sugar and exponentially many agents with exponentially few sugar. That's what's actually said. Uh, the power law, you, you actually encounter it a lot in, um, in social systems and in many, different, in many different complex systems. For example, scale-free networks have an extremely unequal distribution of links most of them uh, aggregating at the hub. So that's also a power law. If the power law is presented uh, not as a, now if you're taking some, uh, taking some statistics card, not as a PDF, but as a CDF, then it's called a Pareto distribution. But it's, it's, it's the same thing. Maybe you also heard of SIP flaw. SIP flaw, it's, it's, it's also the same power law. It's just differently ranked. So Pareto distribution, SIP flaw, and, uh, SIP flaw and uh, power law are all the same thing. Basically, what they say is that something is extremely unequally distributed.
again, exponentially few with exponentially much and exponentially many with exponentially little. So that's what you get here. And so basically now we grew the income distribution as it exists in society. We basically replicate it. We replicate it what happens in society, which is quite amazing because our model is really quite simple. But with that, we can already replicate a phenomena, an emergent phenomenon that we have found over the last hundreds of years in, in, all, in all modern societies. So let's summarize our first three sugarscape model variations, increasingly more sophisticated variation of sugarscape. We started with sugarscape number one, and things to notice that we already, we already were able to grow, uh, replicate an evolution of, of society with regards to their vision and metabolism. So yes, we, we model evolutionary pressure, evolutionary dynamics, which is not a minor thing. Uh, then what about our modeling assumptions was that there was limited vision and instant growback of the sugar patches. And together they led to this terracing. So we had our four income groups. And we have a pretty skewed welcome distribution among these four different terraces. So that's, that's what we found in the first model. Second model, we had the change was a gradual grow back. So now the sugar didn't grow back instantaneously. And what we found is there was more competition. If the, la if the environment changes, you have to be fitter in order to adapt. And we also saw more evolutionary pressure, therefore, on the vision and the, and the metabolism. We got, we got more extreme values for both of them. And third, with our third simulation, we found actually that we, we said what well, there was the modeling assumption changes that there's no indefinite, indefinite wealth accumulation. So that we had a death and a random redistribution. And that was already enough. It's actually surprisingly little assumptions if you think about it. Like we just walked through it ourselves. It's surprise. You can look at the code that's behind there. Feel free to open it up. It's a very simple code. And we were able to replicate something that humanity has been struggling with for hundreds of years is this extreme unequal income distribution, which is called a Pareto distribution. And that emerged from the bottom up from our assumptions. And that's one of the goals often in Asian art, but often one of the goals is to see if we find a macro behavior, to use Schelling's words, a macro behavior, and we try to find the minimum assumptions, the minimum behavior of the individuals that allow us to grow or to replicate this macro behavior. So why is it we found this Pareto distribution, which some scientists say, right, that's a, a natural order, right, a, a law of nature. We cannot do anything against it. That's just what we found and found and found over again, this unequal income distribution. And the question is, so where does it come from? So while scientists for hundreds of years basically saw that and said, well, that's a law of nature just because we see it, just like gravity it's a law of nature. So where does it come from? You're not really sure yet. There's several theories that try to explain where gravity comes from. Uh, now, for us, on this higher level of scientific abstraction, on the social level, we now grew it ourselves. So the cool thing is now you can basically open it up and look at where it comes from. So where does this extreme income, in, in unequal income distribution actually come from? What are the parameters that lead to that? So what do you think? Well, we have several candidates why we have that. One could be the physical landscape. So what we would do now is we would play around with our physical landscape and manipulate it and see actually, does it come from the physical landscape, this unequal income distribution? The other one is, it might be one of the rules. You know, we said, move to the next open spot with the most sugar and consume it. So what if we would say, well, they are not sugar maximizing agents. We give them kind of like a different incentives. For example, be nice to your other agent or something. You know, maybe, do you think it comes from that? You think it comes from the rule? I don't know. What about random genetic endowments? For example, the cognitive abilities that people have, the vision, the metabolism that people have, or the maximum age. So is that actually something? Well, if that's something, well, that's just how we come, how agents come. So not a lot we can do then. Or does it come from the initial location? We just randomly dropped our agents there. So where actually, where does it come from? What do you think? Which one of these is the culprit? Well, actually all of them. 
the truth is it's a complex social system and all of them are the culprits. So it's not so easy to change it. It's kind of like more like an ecosystem. Actually, what you will see and we do that is you try to go in, you change one and actually your entire ecosystem kind of like flips on its head. So uh, we have to be careful. Now, the cool thing is with this computer simulations, we can try it out without actually destroying any real ecosystem. Like no humans will be harmed if we do, if we test the craziest hypothesis that we have. We can make an extremely, you know, society, as we said, when shelling, we had a completely racist society. We don't have to do that in reality. It's enough to do that in our computer and, and see how things turned out. So that's the, that's the good thing about doing computer simulations and try to piece these complex dynamics apart. But the answer to this question is all of them matter. Now let's dig in a little bit deeper and see if we can change some of them and play around with them. One theory that it tries to explain something like wealth accumulation is the neoclassical theory from, from economics. And that would basically, and I take a very broad brush now, say, well, uh, pe some people are rich and some people are poorer. That depends on the abilities of these people. I mean, some people are just smarter. They get rich and some people are just lazy. And if they're lazy and they don't have the motivation, they don't have these kind of characteristics, they will just end up poor. A very popular theory, actually. Many people think like that on the political spectrum in all kinds of countries. Uh, it's, it's very ingrained in people if you think about it. People really think poverty often comes out of people just, just being lazy. So we could now test the neoclassical theory, which is as, per, as, as popular, especially in Western cultures. So, okay, so let's look at our agents and we can color them now by vision. So now we have different colors. We have the dark ones have, have more vision and the light ones have less vision. And we run it a little bit. We have our reproductive cycle, so actually our, our death cycle. So we have to run it a few generations. Let's run it to 200 ticks. So 200 ticks, we are, we are pretty much, yeah, we found our income distribution, our unequal income distribution. And let's check some out. So we go over here to somebody who is pretty far out there. We can expect this turtle. Interesting enough, they're always called turtles uh, in that logo that has an historical reason. And you can find somebody here with a very high vision, vision of six. That's actually the good as a vision as you can get. And then we can see somebody here on top of the mountain uh, and we expect this and it has a vision of one. That's as low as it gets. So we have a highly skilled person that is actually not rich. That's not on the top of the mountain. It's actually down there. And there might be a reason to it, right? Because he is so skilled, he can just like try to be lazy. I don't know. You can have your theory about it and test it as well. Same for metabolism. Uh, we can check it out now, run it a little bit and see if metabolism, maybe it's that. Uh, it's people who are more productive, more productive, more efficient. And we can see basically the same thing. We, we find some people who are out there who are actually pretty poor, but highly effective, highly productive. That's maybe why they hang out out there. Now, on average, you can run your correlation, your regression, and you can probably see maybe there tend to be more higher skilled, uh, more productive people in the richer segments as compared that tend to be on average a smaller percentage in the poorer segments and you can do this ever but if you look at it really look at this look at this diversity it's not you can say that our unequal income distribution is a direct reflection of the skills and the productivity the efficiency of the people and the lazy and the dummies are the poor ones. No, we can absolutely not say that. That is not, that's not what we can find here. And the cool thing is with the computer simulation, we can look under the hood and actually see in our case what leads to that. And even better, we can try to change it. So while some economists and social scientists say, well, this income inequality, that's just a natural order, a, a law of nature, because we always find it and we always have found it in history. Well, let's see if in our theoretical model we can change it. So for example, we could say that it has to do with the initial level of endowment. So let's change our level of endowment. We can do that here. And instead of having a distribution between five and 25, we can say everybody gets between one and two sugars at the beginning. So they're equ quite equal between one and two, uh, equally poor at the beginning. 
So, and we can see how our model works out. We have it run, we have it run over some periods, and we can see, well, as I said, we need to go, we need to go up, have, have a generation die and come back, and we see, well, it's actually quite unequal. Quite unequal, there are some fluctuations, and now it kind of like levels out, and um, yeah, we pretty much get the same thing again. So if people are kind of like equally poor, you know, at the beginning, we have the same problem. Some get rich and some stay poor. And we have a pretty high, pretty high inequality in our society. What if uh, we change it up a little bit? For example, let's say we make some extremely rich. They get 200 sugars at the beginning and some extremely poor. They only get one sugar at the beginning. So we start out with some people who, for example, inherit a lot and some people who are just poor. And let's see, oh, interesting, interesting. We kind of like almost get like a normal curve, right? That's almost what it looks like. We have a big middle class. Wow, wow. So we actually started out with making some extremely rich. You might have thought like, whoa, that already introduces inequality at the outset. But turns out we get a pretty big middle class here. Right, interesting. What about if we make everybody kind of like equally rich? So we have still some diversity, some of our agent diversity. So for example, we make the minimum 99. So at the minimum, every agent gets as initial endowment 199 sugars, 199 sugars, and as a maximum 200. So there's still some difference, but between 199 and 200, pretty similar. What do you think will happen now? Will we get a more unequal or a more just society? So let's check it out. Um, let's run it. And yeah, that looks pretty good to me. Now we get a pretty big middle class, actually. And you get a few, a few rich and a few poor. That's actually, that's what you want, right? And a, a very small inequality. I mean, the area under the Gini curve is very small. As you can see, the blue line uh, is very much at the bottom. So, yes, we found a solution. The solution is just make everybody equally rich from the outset. <laughs> okay. All right. So, I mean, that's okay. Uh, I mean, that's a theoretical solution. It's kind of like if you ask a mathematician of you know, uh, how, how to make the, the cow, the fastest running cow, and the mathematician answers and says, well, let's imagine a spherical cow, right? Yes, maybe the cow could be fast, it would be spherical, but it's not really, it's not, you know, the spherical cow argument does not really work. And just to say like, well, let's take all the poor in the world and give them the same salary as the richest people have in Silicon Valley. Yeah, that, why, that might be great. And, and these people in Silicon Valley are right now the richest people on, on planet Earth. But uh, yeah, no, that is uh, good. We found a theoretical way out. <laughs> but uh, practically, we have to maybe search a little bit more. But that was basically the idea to also see we can, the basic argument here, and when we don't have to go, the time to go deeper. But it is not a law of nature. It's not a natural order. It's not completely unavoidable that we have this extreme unequal income distribution. We can change it. We, we might not want to change it in some ways. We might not want to have a society where we give everybody riches at the outset because then maybe we have to also then model in they might become lazy, they might become complacent, they might become entitled. So we have to see what actually then works. But what we saw here with our really very short exploration is it's not unavoidable. We can design societies and that's my basic point here. We can look for ways how we can societies to build the societies that we want to build. And if we would like to have a more just a more equal society, uh, a less segregated society. For example, we can look for ways. It's not that we have to throw up our hands up in despair and say, there's a law of nature, no. So same as what we did with Schelling's model, let's make this model a little bit more sophisticated. So let's see if we can raise the level of fidelity and move it a little bit closer to, to a little bit more realistic assumptions. So here we can see our extended version of a sugarscape, and you can see there are much more bells and whistles here, a lot of 
a lot of different sliders that, that allow us to introduce additional features to make it always more realistic, make our model always more realistic. Realistic Ian Weaver programmed that in an older version of, of NetLogo, 4.0.5. You're, you're welcome to check it out online and download it and play with it yourself. And, um, well, what's the first uh, characteristic, additional characteristic we want to explore? Well, of course, it's sex. You know, I mean, as Ella Fitzgerald says it, the birds do it and the bees do it and even educated fleas do it. So let's do it. Let's do the most natural thing, right? Let's do sex on Sugarscape. So wait, so wait. Okay, so how, how do we do it? So <laughs> it works like this. Um, well, first of all, we have uh, two different genders here, women and men, you might say, in, in our setup. And then uh, if, you, if your level of sugar that you have right now is at least as high as your initial endowment, that means if you didn't party it all off and you were responsible and you, know, you still have, have at least as much sugar or more, uh, and you meet uh, a neighbor of the opposite sex, then, well, there might be several, so you go by random order, uh, of your neighbors of the opposite sex, you know, just like in every good neighborhood bar, you know, <laughs> just, not just kidding. And um, then you see if this, if the neighbor also has the same condition, has has enough sugar, then, well, then comes the hard part of life, right? You deplete your sugar by half, both of you, because that's not only the fun. Children are really expensive, and with that, that's the endowment. Of, of your children. There has to be an empty patch as well around, and, and on this empty patch, then a child will be placed with both of your half sugar endow endowment, and this, this child inherits uh, a, a combination of the genetic characteristics, vision, and metabolism from both of the parents. So, so that's how it works. And uh, let's see what's the effect then in our society. So we do here, we do the setup, and then we keep on going. Uh, and we can go a little bit faster. And we can see, first of all, what our agents, whoa, they explode. The number of agents really goes up. We're already in 100 ticks. And then, well, then it seems to level out a bit. It seems to level out and stay, no. No, the level of agents actually then goes down. Wow, interesting. So we were almost at 1,300 agents, so 1,200 something, and then we go down to 800. Down to 800 agents, and then it picks up again. And then it picks up again, up again to, yeah, 1,300, 1,300 something. And it does not stay there. It goes down again. We see uh, vision again increases. So it started at 3.5. I know like the average, you can also see vision between 1 and 6. So 3.5 was the average. And here we are already up at 5. Metabolism also, you can say we said metabolism between 1 and 4. Um, so you started here at 2.5 average and then went down. Metabolism is already optimized. We have a metabolism of one. So everybody has a perfect metabolism. Well, good and good good genes that that these offspring inherit. We had 400 time steps, so no original parent is left over. You know, maximal age is 100. And um, yeah, the vision still seems to evolve. And we still have these fluctuations. Maybe accelerate a little bit to see if these fluctuations, do they seem to level out over time? If you go faster and faster, this interface won't update anymore, but you can see um, by the sliders that the data is still accumulated, the data that we simulate, and it goes, no, it doesn't really, it doesn't really become more narrow, right? We fluctuate between 1,300 and 800. That's, that's our fluctuation. Evolution keeps on pushing. Our vision goes up, 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 and it seems kind of like also we are bottom, bottom, we are we are maximizing, not <laughs> bottoming out. Uh, we are maximizing our vision. Yeah, we go all the way up to six. Six is the maximal vision that we gave our um, our agents, and where well, we we evolve it all the, uh, all the way. Our our society having an optimally society in terms of their vision and the metabolism, it still it still keeps on fluctuating. Interesting. Where do these fluctuations come from? Why do you, what do you think? Why does it fluctuate up and down? Hmm. 
Well, it's a, it's a predator-prey dynamic. Lotka Volterra, these are the two researchers who, who basically worked that out, um, these equations, you often see that in predator-prey systems, in ecological systems, for example, it's basically, it goes up when you, you produce a lot of children and then you deplete the resources. It's the dependency on the resources because if you have, you basically have overpopulation. You have too many, too many people now, so we overpopulate the earth, our, our artificial earth here, and with that, resources, resources become scarce, and therefore the population cannot keep up with. And that's kind of like the average here in between where we fluctuate around. So the fluctuations are introduced by the fluctuating environment because the sugar has to grow back, and if there's too many, it's not enough to sustain the population, overpopulation, the population gets reduced. And then if there's too little, there's a time lag, and then it catches up. We can also see if we now, so now we maximized our vision and we maximized our metabolism. Right now here, the fluctuations become a little a little less pronounced because we have optimal and optimal society here, but we can still see there is this, there is this fluctuation going up and down because the environment still needs time to grow back. Our sugar patches still need time to grow back. So now we could have another variation. Let's put in something different. So that was sugar scape, let's call it sugar scape version number four. Let's have sugar scape version number five. And there's here a very interesting button, inheritance button, inheritance button. So what this inheritance button does, this new rule that we introduce in our artificial society, is that when an agent dies, uh, the remaining wealth that this agent has is divided among all his or her children, just like in reality. What do you think will happen? What do you think is different in our society? What effect, think about it, what effect does inheritance have for example, on the number of agents and also on the evolution of agents. Is there more or less evolutionary pressure? Let's check it out. So we have our setup and we go and we see, okay, the number of agents also increases at the beginning. We increase our number of agents, start it again with 400 agents. And then we see, okay, so we reach... Same here, 1,200, 1,200 something agents, 1,300 agents, and we also max out. And then what happens? After we maxed out, yes, we do fluctuate. We do fluctuate too, we're going down, we're going down from 1,300, we're going, uh, but we don't bottom so much. We stay above 1,000, so we don't go down to 800, in the previous simulation, we went down to 800, and here we stay above 1,000. And actually, now we even get higher. We're 1,400 now. I've never had so many agents. We're 1,400, and we fluctuate down again. The predator-prey dynamic has an effect, but we don't bottom as much. We are now here in 1,100. That's the bottom. We don't go all the way to 800. Previously, we fluctuated to 800, somewhere down here. So the fluctuations are not as pronounced. As you can see, evolution is still going on. We optimized our metabolism. That's, that seems to be very sensitive metabolism. So that optimized very quickly. Our vision is still increasing. It is still increasing. Maybe if we can now accelerate a little bit. Interesting, the fluctuations, yes, become less and less. And uh, let's stop it. So it's 600, it's 600 ticks. Let's stop it around there. We are now at 600, 601 time steps. And let's look at it. Maybe we can compare it without the inheritance rule. So that's kind of like the dynamic that we get. It bottoms out much quicker. And vision, metabolism optimized vision, increased from 3.5, which is just the random setup, up to 5.2. But up to 5.2, that's how far we got, right? In vision, after 600 time steps. Let's compare that with when we turn the inheritance, inheritance, inheritance setting off. And we go. And we see, yes, we, we increase uh, our population, as we've seen before. We can accelerate that maybe a little bit. We optimize it, and then 
Yes, again, we have a deeper dip, so that was not coincidence. We are down at 800 here, maximum 1,300, and we dip 800. The, the, the fluctuations, the predator prey, Lotka Volterra fluctuations are surely more pronounced. We optimize our metabolism very quickly, very sensitive, and let's see what happens to our vision. So we are now here at 500 time steps, 550 time steps. Let's go all the way up to 600 to make it comparable. 601 we had, right? And we see... Well, we basically, we optimized our vision quite a bit, right? We're in 5.6, 5.7, so not in 5.2. There is much more evolutionary, well, much more, significant amount more evolutionary pressure if we turn the inheritance mechanism off. So if we don't inherit to children, there's more evolutionary pressure. Our society evolves quicker. Why is that? Well, it is because if you inherit to children, even the ones who are not the fittest, rich daddy, rich mommy gives them the money, and even so they're not the best of the breed, they can still hang in there, right? They don't need to make the best effort, have the best vision or whatever. They can still survive. So actually, the inheritance mechanism reduces the amount of competition that we have. We don't have to compete for the best in society, which inheritance. We can just, you know... Give it to children who are not who are not the best in best in, in show and and still and they can still survive. So it slows down inheritance mechanism mechanism slows down the speed of evolution in society. In the world of public policy, inheritance mechanism and how to regulate inheritance mechanism, that's uh, very powerful and, and very useful and very common policy tools that you have. And it's regulated in different societies differently. One thing that I'm always fascinated about is if you ask uh, the rich, the super rich, the multimillionaires and the billionaires, especially the self-made ones, uh, the ones that made the fortune themselves during their lifetime, if you ask them about taxes, of course, nobody likes taxes. But if you do an anonymous survey about what taxes are they particularly bothered by or what taxes they find hindering and what taxes they don't mind so much, actually, I always find it fascinating that if the survey is anonymous, it turns out that the self-made multimillionaires and billionaires, they do not mind inheritance tax at all. So basically, they say, you know, uh, after me, uh, I made this money by myself. And when I'm dead, take it from me. Yeah, you can take it from me and distribute. I mean, what I want to give to my children, I can give through them during the, during my lifetime and make sure they're on the right path and you know they have everything they need. But actually, if you then take the money from me and distribute it for the people who really need it, who also want to be self-made, that I don't have a problem with it now. They also say you kind of like have to force me, right? And nobody should know because if my children would know that I kind of like would like you to take these hundreds of millions of dollars from me, they would, I, I want them to respect my gravestone. Right? So, so obviously that has to be an anonymous survey and respect the privacy of, of family relationships within there. But in that case, inheritance, uh, inheritance tax and, and, and regulation is actually something that Honestly, it could be a very powerful tool to make more just societies and more prosperous societies, as you've seen it right now. Basically, when people die, redistribute. And that's what we kind of like played with, if that's useful, or if it's not useful. What other big social policy tools are there to design society? One very famous one uh, that made a lot of noise was from a social theorist, a really deep thinker called Karl Marx. And Karl Marx developed a theory, Das Kapital, which had actually also other ramifications. He was a polymath, a critical scholar, an, an economist, a social scientist, a sociologist. Everybody claims he was theirs. And then also some politicians took his theories and made political theories out of it. Um, uh, but he was an intellectual and academic. And, and one of the ideas he thought about society, and he thought, deeply about society. If you read books like Das Kapital, uh, The Capital, uh, it reads like an introduction of 101 economics. Actually, most of what he actually analyzed are nowadays have become the foundations of how we think about economics. So they're incorporated in the standard syllabus in the standard textbooks. 
And one of the things, the conclusions that after thinking deeply and observing uh, the economy uh, and how things are distributed, uh, he thought, well, there are different classes that emerge in an economy. And wh why are there different classes? And one of his deep insights was, well, that's because of the interest rate. Uh, so the idea is that you have capital and just by the fact of capital uh, through the interest rate, you're gaining more capital. Well, that leads actually to a self-reinforcing positive feedback loop, whereas the ones that have capital get more capital and the rich get richer and the ones that don't have capital actually have to borrow and have to pay the interest rate and get less capital and actually then you know, become poor and that creates a class society. That's why he called his book The Capital. Uh, and the theory of capitalism uh, is, uh, is described in that book and, and criticized in that book because he said, well, if you would do away with the interest rate, you would have a completely different society. Now, how you would design such a society, that's something up to question, but it is in the spirit of going out of thinking out of the box, looking for innovative solutions to see how we can actually make the economy work. If it does work, if it doesn't work, and what aspects of it works. Many of the aspects, many of the idea he had are nowadays integrated in our, in our economic systems. Um, and one of the interesting, so let's look at that. Let's look at this argument of the interest rate. So what we do in the next model in Sugarscape number six is we create lenders and borrowers and how that actually works is that, that you have loans. Loans, tradition in our setup would naturally, if you think about it, benefit uh, from the old and from the rich who don't need as much as they have, especially for reproduction. So thinking of bird's eye view of entire society, it's important for us to reproduce, that somebody reproduces. Uh, the old and the rich can only reproduce to a certain extent, so may, there might be some others who could be reproducing fostering our society and our, our entire species, but don't have enough resources. Remember, in order to reproduce, you need to have at least as much resources that you started out with. So when a fertile agent uh, match, uh, is in need of sugar in order to fulfill the reproduction requirement, he can go to a, somebody who has too much, gives, gives as much until the reproduction need is met or, or half of it. And then uh, after 10 ticks, so after 10 time steps, uh, the borrower pays the, pays the sugar back to the lender plus a certain interest rate. They can have a 10% uh, interest rate. Or if there's not enough money, he, he will not default, he will give half of the wealth and then 10 ticks later, 10 time frames later. Uh, that's how we can program. That's one way of programming it. You could change that and, cha and, and, and test the different conditions. So let's see what happens. So here we have our setup of, of loans. Uh, everything else is pretty much the same. We have our replacement rule on. That means we do have uh, sexual reproduction and children. Now we color our agent by who is a lender and who is a borrower. So if we go, go now, we first see the number of agents uh, increases. We start with 400 again. And here we see different kinds of agents. And we see the gray ones are the ones who do n neither lend nor borrow, and we see they quickly decline at the beginning. So they are not very competitive. They don't participate in that, in that lending borrowing game. We see here the dark purple are the lenders, and we see they quickly increase their wealth. That makes sense because they're getting an interest rate, right? They're getting an interest rate of 10%, whereas the borrowers uh, here, the ones who borrow, the, the pink ones, are kind of like here in the middle. They're doing better than the ones that do not participate in lending and borrowing. And um, here, this, this medium purple one are the ones who are lenders and, and the ones who are borrowing. So we see clearly that we have a social hierarchy, but the social hierarchy overall seems to benefit everybody. One thing we can also notice here by the number of agents is we don't have these fluctuations anymore. It's not like uh, the population is overdoing it and, and completely exploiting its environment because even if you get into a hard environment, if you get into a recession where there's not enough resources around, you can lend some money and you can get over the hardship. Now it seems we are reaching some kind of plateau. Let's see if that will accelerate a little bit so we can see how that actually turns out. During these times, you can also see here, and there, there are changes, the ones who are neither lending nor borrowing money are going up. Now they're going down again. And wow, we never had so many 
agents. Yeah, we had 1,300 agents. We, we reached that very quickly, but stable. We don't fluctuate to this 1,300. Uh, we are getting a pretty stable society, and we're getting a social hierarchy at the end. It took a, a bit to settle in, but we have the lenders on top, the capitalists, the, the ones who are lending money and getting interest rate, getting rich just by having capital. Then afterwards, we have the ones who are borrowing, the ones who are benefiting from it and actually getting over this drought, over these, over these times where there are not enough resources, resources by, by borrowing money. Then comes the ones who, who neither participate in either of them. And then at the bottom, there are the lenders and the borrowers. Uh, interesting, you can think about why, why they are at the bottom. So we have, we now grew a social hierarchy. We grew different classes by this lending and borrowing. So it has something to do with the classes, as Marx said. All right? we, we do clearly say, see different classes just produced by this phenomenon of the interest rate. So the interest rate is a very important aspect of the economy and very related to the classes. That was to the class system in society. That was Marx, Marx's analysis. Right? So now we can also see, we can uh, combine it with something of our previous result. For example, our inheritance setting. Yes, let's turn on our inheritance setting. And what we do now with this inheritance setting is not only that you inherit uh, the fortune that, uh, that your, your, your fathers and mothers, your parents made, but you also inherit their debt. Wow, let's imagine that. So we don't only pass the fortune on, but if, if, if your parents inherited debt, you also pass the debt on. What do you think will happen now with society? Well, it's pretty much a shot in the, if you can think through that, amazing. I don't know if I couldn't. So let's check it out. And that's what we do with agent-based modeling. We just, we just test it and see what we get. And you can see here, uh, the gray ones are going down again. The lenders are again getting their, their position on top. The borrower seems like, it does, seems like it really doesn't have a difference if you put this policy in. Right, it seems like we pretty much get the same result. So, well, that might be a policy that doesn't really matter uh, in the big scheme of things. Oh, wait, now something happens. Now, somehow, the gray ones, the ones that are neither lending nor borrowing, are really increasing. They caught up with the capitalists. That means the ones that don't participate in the, in the financial market, that don't get get credits and they don't get mortgages, these ones are now, well, they're outcompeting everybody. They're here now on top. After some, after 300, let's say after three generations, after three generations playing this game of passing on debt to others. Um, I see some fluctuations here. And now we get a different kind of social, social hierarchy. Clearly, the gray ones, the ones who do not participate in, in the financial capitalist system of borrowing and lending and interest rate uh, reimbursement are now the ones who do best, followed by the capitalists, followed by the lenders, and then followed by the borrowers. That means, yes, if I, if I would have uh, a law like this that passes on not only the good fortune, but passes on also the debt that I have, actually in this case, uh, the group... Uh, the, the, the group that is naturally uh, competing on some other basis. Maybe they have a better vision. Maybe they have a better metabolism. Maybe they're just more lucky in some other sense that they take the right turn at one point. But we can see, yeah, it would be interesting now to test that for evolution and see if that brings on more evolutionary pressure on society because now um, it seems like, yeah, the gray ones which are the ones who compete on basis of their natural endowment, uh, seem to outcompete everybody else. So again, we can influence society just with um, a quite simple change in policy, in public policy. Okay, there's already been a lot of options. What else could we explore? One of the benefits of agent-based computer simulations is that you can often have a very nice and intuitive visual presentation of your dynamics. So you don't have to imagine something uh, visually looking at equations. You can actually make it visible by these, 
by the simulations, especially if you have a nice simulation software like we have here with net logo. And then you can see how things spatially, for example, evolve. Shelling segregation model was a spatial model, and it lends to, if you have an interface like that, these kind of models, these kind of analysis lend itself to be simulated on this kind of platform. So one question we could now analyze and could add to it is a question extremely important in the current phase of globalization, and it is migration. Right? How do people migrate? Where do they migrate? And uh, that's an like, important question. So let's try to, to kind of like bake that into our model just because it's not complicated enough yet. And let's look at migration. So we start out with our agent here in the lower left corner. And we have them in the lower left corner. And now if I press go, what do you think? How will they move and in what direction will they move? All right, let's check it out then. So here we have our setup in Go, and we can see when we go one and two steps. Oh yeah, the first thing we notice, remember they live on a donut, so if you go out here, you come, you come back in from the top, and if you go out on this side, you come back on the other side of the donut. Right, so they live on the torus, that's, a, that's mathematical. And then you see when we move, kind of like they move diagonally. Well, they move towards the other hill of sugar, especially the ones with good vision. So they move over there, and you see they move diagonally. It makes kind of like sense. Now, the surprising thing is they can, the individual can only move horizontally and vertically because that's how we program them. An individual cannot move diagonally, but if you look at it, it really looks, it really looks like the society moves diagonally. Right? Clearly, it looks like that. Um, even so, we programmed, you can only go horizontally and vertically. You can never make a diagonal step. So actually, the society can do something, or it appears to us the society can do something that the individual does not. So that's kind of like uh, a kind of emergence. It's an emergence of a diagonal movement that is not possible for any of the individuals but the total is more than the sum of its parts, and it can do things that an individual cannot. And if you look at it, feel free to replay it. It really looks like the society moves diagonally. So that's an example of that. Now notice, that's a different kind of emergence than the emergence I talked about before. Before, I talked an emergence of an emergent income distribution. So the diagonal movement is kind of like the total substitutes, or, or substitutes an, a limitation of the individual, whereas, in the, in the previous case of the emergent income distribution, uh, it was the total aggregates individual characteristics. And honestly, until now, there is no text. The, the word emergence is not really a very lucky word. It's kind of like a placeholder because we do not understand it fully yet. Uh, we, we think it has something to do with nonlinearity. But again, nonlinearity is everything that's not linear. So there's a lot of things that are nonlinear. Actually, almost everything except the linear is nonlinear. Uh, 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 we don't know. It has to do with the total. The more is different. Is it qualitatively different? But emergence is really not a lucky word, but that's all we have under now to explain these kind of phenomena. And it will be up for future uh, scholars, for us also in the future, to develop maybe kind of like taxonomy, what different kinds of emergence there are. If you think, think, think through that, these are clearly two different kinds of emergent phenomena. There might be more other different kinds of emergent phenomena, but for now, I'm not going to lead you down that rabbit hole. I leave you just like this. There are different kinds of emergence, and it's a placeholder for now. It's, it's, it's really a, can be a confusing word the more you think about it, as important as it is, especially if you talk about and emergent phenomena like societies. Since I already just mentioned shelling, let's do that. Let's bring shelling into the game. Let's bring cultural similarity into the game. This was, it's a very sugarscape, seems to be a very economic model, but maybe there are things stronger than making a good livelihood and satisfying all your, your economic needs. Let's think about culture. Uh, and so what you can do here uh, on this uh, slider, we can bring culture into the game. And if you start with all uh, agents red, let's start out with that. And we run our simulations. We can see that's well, that's what to be expected. It's a simple, it's a simple sugar scape model. To be expected, we run a few generations. And now we turn on the culture button. So actually, we can see the red and the blue, they are different cultural preferences, might be a different race, 
fans of a different sports club, whatever, whatever you might want, different religious congregations, for example. And you can see, yes, up there, it's more like the blue down there, a more the reddish one. And over time, as you might have observed now, it becomes always more extreme. And now being after a few generations, after 600 uh, generations, you see it's almost, yes, shelling was right. Uh, at the beginning, it took some time. It took actually longer if, uh, because people kind of got stuck got stuck, they were very comfortable economically, but at the end, yes, uh, making a good livelihood is no match to cultural pressure. We want to we wanna hang with our, with our peers at the end. And, and there's a lot of, it's not only economics here, there are other forces at play, and you can study that. Now you can see, for example, also combine it, you can look at individual agents. So there's a blue one still hanging out in Redland. So you can look at this agent, and for example, high hypothesis, maybe it has to do with the vision. So this is a vision level of three, so it's, it's actually a pretty good vision. So it's pretty a good vision, but this person still hangs out in Redland. So you can theorize and have your hypothesis. What does it have to do with that somebody hangs out longer with the others or doesn't hang out longer with the others? And how can you balance actually economic pressures? And maybe you can come up with something, a combination of economics and social desirability, cultural adoption, that you have a more mixed society. And you can see here after 700, almost 800 ticks, Here's eight generations, eight, eight, nine generations, minimally eight, nine generations, you still have a very mixed society. That means if you find the right mix between economic incentives, cultural incentives, social incentives, you have ever more options on the table in order to solve pressing social issues as it is social segregation. As a third example of something that might motivate you to move is not only the initial conditions or not only the pressure from others, it might also be a changing landscape, a changing fitness landscape. So for example, we could introduce seasons. So let's start our normal model without any seasons. That's what it runs. And what I do down here is every 40 ticks, say like half of the life of a person, we now start uh, a season. And uh, as you can see now, now it's, it's winter in the north, now it's winter in the south. So it's winter in the south right now and uh, sugar grows back slower in winter. Now it's winter in the northern hemisphere, sugar grows slower in the winter, it's summer in the south, it changes. It changes every 40 ticks. And if you accelerate that, you can clearly see this changing seasons. Now we don't have to wait 40 years. We can accelerate that and you see that agents migrate, migrate with seasonality. Which, which makes sense. Now you can, again, hypothesize and see which kind of agents migrate and which kinds of agents not. What's the metabolism rate? What's the vision rate? What's their skill uh, with it? And follow them. And what you will see and what you will find out when you do that is, first of all, the collective as a whole clearly follows the season. But then if you dig deeper, you will see that there are two kinds of different agents. Once they're more like bears, bear-like hibernation. So they kind of like stay uh, put and are actually, maybe they're pretty blind, but metabolistically highly, so look at this one, kind of like went to the outskirts, right? It's like, oh, uh, stop that. I'm not, I'm not into moving around. I'm just staying out here. You know, I'm, my metabolism is really good. My vision is really bad. Uh, that's too crazy going up and down. I'm just staying out here on this island and that's where I am, more than comfortable. And they are able to survive like that. Then there are other ones, maybe their metabolism pressures them to always get to the more sugar and their vision enables them to, able, be, to be able to do that. So they're more like birds, not like bears, but like birds. And they have this bird-like migration. You will see them going up, going down, going always where summer is. So they migrate back and forth. So even so you have uh, some behavior on the macro scale and clearly, yes, yeah, society follows the season. There are different kinds of individuals and agent-based modeling allows you to study these different agents uh, and, and their behavior and figure it and, and put it into uh, the big picture and then you can come up with all kinds of theories. So this kind, for example, would be important to figure out, I mean, there's a lot of uh, green card issues now. Uh, who do you want to bring into a country? How should 
skilled workers migrate where there is a demand. For example, there's a demand for a different sector in a different country. And if you take the bird's eye view, so I was working at the United Nations for a long time, uh, for 15 years. And uh, yes, you have a different perspective if you look at the world from the perspective of the United Nations, because you know you look at society from a whole, and then from this perspective, you can see like what would be optimal for workers and how, how would they move? Now that's different if you have the perspective from inside a society. One of my, one of my bosses, one of my directors at the United Nations Secretariat, uh, would always say he was from Brazil and he had this uh, funny kind of humor and he would always say, you know, he would say, the person doesn't think with their head, they actually think with their behind. Because depending on the chair that they are sitting in, they think differently. And if you think about this issue, for example, from a global perspective of the United Nations, you get to one conclusion. If you think of it from a national perspective, you will think through it another conclusion. And with age-based modeling, you can simulate the benefits and drawbacks of these different perspectives by going high, by going to the macro level, and by going to the details of the micro motives of the individual agents. Tired yet of SugarScape? Oh no, take a break. It's, it, it's a lot. Uh, continue another time if you're tired, but I cannot let you go without this one. This is extremely important. It has to do with pollution because we're extracting sugar here, happy-go-lucky, uh, but in reality, a very realistic assumption is you extract something, especially a resource, you, you also pollute. There's a, it's a negative externality to that. So what if we put in pollution? So the sugar extraction also pollutes. So first of all, we start our model here. Everybody climbs on top of the hill and we can see if there is pollution, there's no pollution. So we change our outlook and can see like with x-rays what's going on. And now we can turn on our pollution. Wow, did you see what happened? Uh, everybody dispersed. Let's do that again. Let's do that again so you can see that. People do not like to stay in polluted areas. That's That makes sense. That's a realistic assumption as well. So here we go. Everybody climbs on top of the hill, extracting sugar. And now once we turn it on, turn it on and everybody disperses. So that also hits our society pretty hard. Nobody wants to stay on top here. Uh, it hits our income pretty hard. Also, even our evolutionary trajectory is affected by that because it's not so easy anymore to extract the resources and you might be able to run in and out of the pollution, but you definitely don't want to stay, stay there. And you can see some others that actually go to some rural areas. I mean, there's not a lot going on uh, up there and down there, uh, but at least there's no pollution. So if their metabolism allows them to hang around there, that's actually not a bad idea for you because Whereas there's, where, where there's sugar and where sugar is extracted, pollution is going on. Now let's turn on a different slide, diffusion. So now, also how it's often in reality, also we mainly pollute in the cities, in the sugar producing cities, the rural areas will also get affected. And now see if we have pollution, a lot of wind, uh, if you have diffusion of pollution, for example, through wind, life actually becomes even harder for our agent on sugarscape. They kind of like start to terrace again. Uh, they start to hoard at these corners. They really do not want to get further than they have to. They stay put at these terraces. Whoever can get as much sugar as they can, but we see this terracing again. Growing ever more sophisticated and realistic social models, we also have to say that it's, well, here we have only sugar there might be more than one resource, actually, and there is usually more than one resource or one good or one service that, that we are after, uh, additionally to we had social, cultural pressures that might be upon us, environmental pressure. So let's see what happens if we introduce a second resource, so spice. Now we have sugar and spice, and we turn that on. And we see that sugar is, is, is where it is on the bottom, on the bottom left and on the top right. And then the other two sides on the top left and on the bottom right, there's now spice, our second resource. Here we have our setup with two uh, resources. Here we have our sugar, and now we add here our spice to it additionally, and um, agents have to collect both of it. So they have a diversity, agent-based modeling, we, we program a diversity among agents, but uh, they have to at least uh, to some degree 
uh, collect both of it. And we can see if we have our first two steps, we already have some kind of specialization. These blue ones are the ones who require more spices and the red ones are uh, the ones who require more sugar and the black ones are kind of like they, they require a mix of both of it. So obviously for the blue one it makes sense to stay here and for the red ones it makes sense to specialize over there. And as we run our simulation, one first thing that we can notice, we accelerate a little bit, is that, wow, the agent count is going down tremendously. It's a really hard life to collect both the species. We are down at, whoa, at 100, 120 agents. That's, that's really little. I mean, well, they say for us men, it's really hard to multitask. So I, I can feel them. Imagine you have to concentrate on two things at the same time, right? That's a really, that's a really hard life. And you can see that as the effect, and it still continues to go down, and it still continues to go down the number of agents. Now, we can also follow some individual, some individual uh, agents here. We expect them, and we, we watch them, and we can see that, uh, maybe accelerating a little bit, yeah, right now, this agent is filling up on spice, but eventually, if the agent wants to survive, it cannot only hang out in spice. It also has to collect some kind, of, some sugar, and then running out of sugar, going back on to spice. Depending on the metabolism, the agent still has to has to multitask, and that is really hard. If you specialize only on one on one thing, you're lucky enough that it's enough for you to consider on one thing. It's easy, and you have higher chances of survival in this simulation. Otherwise, you have to have a pretty good vision, probably, and and that's to be tested. You can look at that in order to be able to to move around and satisfy satisfy all of your different needs. One response that societies collectively developed as a response to these multiple uh, demands that, that, that we are having is a trade system. So basically, we can still specialize on something. And as Ricardo, one of the founding fathers of economics, then uh, showed, it's better to specialize on one thing and then later to trade. And that can optimize the system as a whole. And that's what we've also been doing. So we can set up a trade system here. And when we now see set, set go, we can first of all see that here the trade well starts out a lot. And as the agents reduce, it gets reduced. And here we need a price. A price in a system, in an economic system, an economic price is basically an emergent phenomena that reflects the supply and the demand of something. So if these dots are below the red line, that means that spice is higher valued than sugar. And if it would be above the red line, it would mean that sugar is higher valued than spice. And finding this equilibrium is, is called Walras law, it's a Walrasianian process of kind of like finding the price, finding a stable price, which mediates between supply and demand of these different products. And that's what you can basically uh, create here. And you can also see since the price is basically an emergent phenomena coming out of supply and demand, we can, we can change it and see how sensitive it is. For example, we could increase the sugar growback interval and increase it to, let's say, four intervals. So sugar is growing slower now, uh, growing only a quarter of this piece. And we can see, well, sugar is now more highly valued. Because sugar is well, more in demand, there's less of it, it's more scarce, so the value of it goes up. There are more people who now suddenly want sugar. Uh, on the other hand, if we now turn it the other way around and increase the scarcity of spices, we can see we basically destroy the price. Uh, it goes down here, the, the, the price of sugar, and now spice is the scarce resource. And, and, and the price at the end evolves according to the law of scarcity, balancing between supply and demand. That is not different from the price uh, of, of Bitcoin, the price of gold, or the price of uh, spices and sugar. And as you can see here, if supply and demand is in equilibrium, it goes back again. One thing you can, you can notice here is that we don't have these red and blue specialists anymore. Even the average agent can, can survive, which is great because, well, we're not all specialists and, we're, and most of us are actually more average. And the trading system helps us to survive because we can help each other out. So as a society, we can make up for, for, for it. 
So, are you ready for Sugarscape 13 to 87? No, I'm just kidding. Let's let's keep it at Lucky 13. That's going to be the last one, I promise. Um, and, and now we're going to start to throw different things together. They call this one, or Ian Weaver, who programmed this, calls it Life on the Brink. What we do now, we keep our two resources, we keep our trade, and we add sexual reproduction. Now, imagine, I already said it's tough to, to multitask. It's a pretty hard life to multitask with two resources. Now, imagine you also have to concentrate and focus on sexual reproduction on, on top of it. Wow. Well, it might be easier for some of us than for others, but uh, for, let's see how our agents on Sugar Escape can deal with, with so many demands. All right. We set it up and we go. We start with our 400 agents and we see they're falling. Yes, they're reducing. Uh, down here, and we can see also like wow, now ooh, 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 they reduce quite a bit, and we killed them. Wow, now we really killed them. That's actually, it's probably they ran out of sugar. That's what we see here. Okay, well that is life on the brink, and we fell off the brink. So let's try to do that again, um, and see if the random initial conditions. Uh, can save us this time. We're still, uh, can we make it? Yes, we're going down and we're going down and we're going down and we are pretty much, again, extinct. Let's try it again. Let's have our setup. And um, what well, is to be expected with sexual reproduction that we reduce the amount of agents at the beginning? Um, because we have these predator-prey Lotka Volterra dynamics. And uh, if you overpopulate the population uh, and you don't have enough resources, you can kill yourselves. Oh, now look at that. Now look at that. We bounced back and we're going up. We're going higher and we're going higher. The prices will stabilize. As there are more people, we have more trade going on. Let's increase that a little bit and see how high we can get. Yes, we probably will get. We see it slows down. We probably will get into our cycles, our sexual reproduction, uh, Lotka Volterra cycles. Let's see if we can put an inheritance mechanism in. Let's put the inheritance mechanism in and see if we can change the course of history. Just like a government, we change the policy, we guide society into a different directions. And yes, we caught it. They should re-elect us. They should really re-elect us. We really did this inheritance policy, really made it work, and we increase our population. Fantastic. Fantastic. We also have, since we have the trade, we, we help kind of like the average, the average Joe, right? We don't help the specialists. They're all black here. And we can see it's going pretty well. Now, in reality, uh, we have other things as well. For example, we have pollution. Let's see. Do we have pollution here? No, no pollution at all. Uh, let's turn on the pollution. Remember that spice is a clean resource. Sugar is the only one that's polluting. So over here, and we can see with pollution, well, it stops. It stops our victory march a little bit. And as we, we pollute our sugar region here, mm, yes, that uh, the pollution doesn't really help. We see also the price. The price uh, of sugar is being destroyed. Spice is becoming more valuable because nobody wants to go and get some sugar, right? Actually, um, yeah, spice is the clean resource, uh, higher valued now also because the population adjusted to it. Uh, what else could we do? What else could we play with? Oh, seasonal settings. Let's see if we do some seasons here. Uh, we see with the seasons, now everybody is over here. And uh, your shorter seasons, now everybody's down here. Well, the seasons do have an effect. Maybe we are not quick enough to adjust for that. Ooh, oh, pollution, maybe we should stop that. A green energy law, maybe. That might help our society, and we are still falling. Because maybe we're adjusting to the seasonal change, climate change. Maybe, wow, and now we have a season, we have adjusted to it. We have to reallocate our, our, our population to different, to different places. And uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, so we are, now we're all down here, and, and now we have to go all up here. Our price stabilizes our population. Anyways, uh, I think that's all I wanted to show you. <laughs> The idea is clearly not that you have to memorize all of that, what happens here, but I wanted to show you it's just as crazy as reality, what we can learn from different agent-based models.
And that's as complicated and complex as it can get. And it can surely get more realistic and, and, and more complicated and more mind-boggling. Don't worry. I will not drag you through more sugarscape landscapes here. And as I already said, the idea is surely now that you memorize these different results in different settings. Basically, what I wanted to show you is that you can grow. I want to walk you through a few ex two examples today, how you can grow increasingly complex artificial society that replicates something very interesting about real societies. And then that helps us to look for solutions without bothering anybody. We are not hurting anybody here if you just experiment in our computer simulation. So that's one very big advantage of doing computer simulations. We can envision worlds that never existed without disadvantaging anybody. And second of all, you can even make it more complex if you want. Uh, to say it in the words of Mein Herr and bring us back to the beginning, you could make a one-to-one -one map, the matrix. Now, the matrix is kind of like the idea of a one-to-one -one map, right? If you remember that Hollywood movie. Uh, if it's useful, what it actually is, if it, uh, well, uh, but you could. Computer simulations are the most powerful modeling tool we ever came up with. Every kind of other modeling tool or theory or mathematical language, differential equation, linear algebra, information theory, they all have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, in computer simulations, you basically can embed, we, have, we haven't found really a, because theoretically, yes, you could. I mean, you would run into storage problem and computational problems and representation models and, and representation problems uh, of your model and all of that, but in theory, Yes, you can scale it up as, as make it as complex. And that's the feeling I wanted to convey to you, to walk you through an increasing complex model of artificial society and then see as well, well, what can you learn from it and how surprising it can actually, how surprising it can actually be. And um, yes, it can be very surprising. So as you know, I, I worked in the highest circle uh, of public policy making. Uh, in, in this globalizing world. And the truth is, so I work personally with presidents and secretaries and ministers and, and CEO of, of the largest companies and most influential NGOs and so forth. And the truth is, like all of us, they also just put on their pants one leg at a time. Right? They also don't really, they don't have a, a, a crystal ball or a magic ball where they can see things. No, they often as ignorant as we are as observers, and it's not often, like often then we think like, oh, it's a conspiracy theory or something's going on that they do. No, they simply also just don't know. It's as surprising as when you play SimCity and suddenly you have a lot of unemployment. It's like, I have no idea where it comes from. Uh, suddenly there's unemployment or, or unemployment goes down and, and the politician's like, yeah, that, that was me. That was, mm, I don't know if that was really uh, her or him that, that did that. Or, or when a, an analyst would say, yes, you do this or that, you increase your interest rate by so much, you reduce unemployment by so, well, see it and model it. Actually, the truth is you will every time get something different. And then considering how many other things you consider in your representation, your abstraction of reality, you might also might or might not get an effect. So it's, it's, it's first of all, not deterministic. And second of all, it's really difficult to do social science. And that's also one of the reasons why I then retired from the United Nations and came to academia because I was excited about these new possibilities, computational models, possibilities that could help us in order to understand, get a little bit of better grasp of the social dynamics that have been challenging humankind for such a long time and still challenging and will always will challenge as long as we evolve and co-evolve with our social systems and institutions. All right, so that answers the second question. That was a long streak. How to grow increasingly complex artificial societies. Let's cross that off. Let's go to our last question for this session. What can we learn from different ABMs, from different Asian-based models? Let's go back first to our summary of, of our Asian-based models and look at the components of Asian-based models. We looked at that in Schelling's model. Let's make it a little bit more conceptual. So we have agents that can be individuals, as in Schelling and as in Sugarscape, but they can also be organizations, sectors uh, or entire societies on a global level, right? You have 200 different countries, you could model that. Uh, and then these agents have different traits. These traits are fixed and are variable. 
So you have a trait that stays with you the entire time, like a genetic endowment, and you have traits that can change. So example, you could also get some skills over time or learn something uh, or become older and die. So, and then there are different rules, rules of behavior that we also program. The idea of agent-based modeling is the benefit that not everybody needs to have the same average rule of behavior. There can be a diversity. Again, these rules can be fixed or they can be variable. More in a game theoretic sense, if you behave like this, I behave like that. But if you behave like this, my strategy is behave like. So there can be a variable set of rules and you can program that in. Um, you can probably not analyti analytically solve it with pen and paper like you would do with most game theory settings. But yeah, let it run. Let it run and see, see what you get. The environment, same, has traits. They are fixed and variable. So different amount of sugar and, and how sugar is growing. And there are rules of the environment as well. These rules can also be fixed and these rules can be variable. So the environment can be changing, interacting with these agents, interacting with the changing variable rules of the agent, which affects the changing variable rules of the environment, which might affect the traits of them. Well, yes, uh, here we, that's what we see. So uh, one reasonable thing to do is then just program it up, code it up and let it run and see what you get. Two very interesting things uh, to think about and two very interesting conclusions that you can get from that is that on the one hand, the macro can be surprising. Let's say the big picture that you're getting can be surprising. And on the other hand, the micro, the individual can be surprising. And that's why I chose Schelling's model and the Sugarscape model because they are complementary in that sense. So Schelling model, the macro has been surprising. So we, we, we programmed our individual agents and told each agent, well, you have uh, a behavior that actually, yes, we observe that in society, 50% you want to be with your peers, but 50% you're very tolerant. So that's a justifiable, justifiable assumption that we see with uh, average tolerant people. Uh, and then the macro has been surprising. The outcome that our, a, a bunch of tolerant people believe to a segregated society. So in Schelling's own words, economists are familiar with systems that lead to aggregate results that the individual neither intends nor needs to be aware of. The results sometimes having no recognizable counterpart with the level, on the level of the individual. For example, savings decisions cause depression or inflation or Adam Smith, famous invisible hand. Everybody is greedy and goes for their own egoistic benefit. And that creates flourishing society where everybody benefits. Now that's, that was a funny thing when Adam Smith came up with that. But yeah, so the macro can be very surprising and counterintuitive. A bunch of egoistic, self-interested, profit-maximizing agents through the invisible hand, as Adam Smith called it, this emergent phenomenon leads to a prosperous society for everybody. Schelling continues, the interplay of individual choices is a complex system with collective results that bear no close relation to the individual intent. Now, on the other hand, what we did is we studied Sugarscape and here the micro, the micro was surprising. So in Epstein and Axel's Sugarscape, we saw that we started with a reasonable macro assumption and very unequal income distribution, for example. Income distribution distributed according to a Pareto distribution as we have seen it for, for centuries. And it was surprising how quickly, how easily we actually got to that with a very simplistic model, actually. So in the words of Epstein and Axel, and Axel say, upon first exposure to these familiar social macroscopic structures, be they migration, skewed income distributions and so forth, some people say, Yes, that looks familiar, but I've seen that before. What's the surprise? The surprise consists precisely in the emergence of familiar macrostructures from the bottom up. Simple local rules that outwardly appear quite remote from the social or collective phenomena they generate. In short, it is not the emergent macroscopic object per se that is surprising, but the generative sufficiency of the simple local rules that has what is sufficient in order to create this familiar macro style. So sometimes the macro can be surprising. And when the macro is surprising, you kind of like go bottom up. So given individual rules that you observe, what is the global behavior? 
like shelling. And on the other hand, you go top down. Uh, the micro might be surprising. So given a global behavior that I, uh, that I observe in society, what should be the individual rules that are sufficient in order to create it? So it's kind of like what you're doing then in between there because you go on these different levels of abstraction from the macro to the micro, from the micro to the macro. You're kind of like you're designing self-organization. You're trying to have individual rules that self-organize in order to grow this macro. So you start with a macro structure and see the individual rules. And it's kind of like an oxymoron to say designing self-organization. It's a contradiction. Like if it's self-organized, how could you design it? But that's what we're trying to do because societies are self-organizing complex adaptive systems. And we try to look for ways of how can we understand these phenomena. Epstein uh, coined a phrase that you will often hear in the, in the computer simulation agent-based modeling community. And he called it the generativist motto. There's the generativist, the ones that generate uh, artificial society. He said, well, if you didn't grow it, you didn't explain it. That means if you can, uh, he also didn't say the other way around, right? You can only explain it uh, if you grow. But he said, if you did not grow it, you did not explain it. So if you want to explain something, grow it. And then you did explain it. So that's the, that's the idea of growing artificial society in order to understand and look under the hood of these emergent social phenomena. All right, this brings us now to our last task, and that is your turn. Explore the NetLogo models library, and you can find NetLogo online, uh, download it for whatever computing interface you have, go under files to the models library, and explore, play around with social emergence. Have fun with it. Thanks for checking in today.